It's time for Windows Weekly. Paul Therod and Mary Jo Foley are here. We've got lots of news. Windows 10. We've actually got a release date, we think, for Windows 10 on phone, on desktop, even on Xbox. We'll also uh, talk about uh, music to code by. Carl Franklin's here to play a little for us and to talk about what's coming up next week at Build. It's all ahead. Windows Weekly time next. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Windows Weekly is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Windows Weekly, episode 410, recorded April 22nd, 2015. Music to code by. Windows Weekly is brought to you by lynda.com, the online learning platform with over 3,000 on-demand video courses to help you strengthen your business, technology, and creative skills. For a free 10-day trial, visit lynda.com slash windows. That's L-Y-N-D-A dot com slash windows. And by... Blue Apron. Blue Apron will send you all the ingredients to cook fresh, delicious meals with simple step-by-step -step instructions right to your door. See what's on the menu this week and get your first two meals free by going to blueapron.com slash twit. That's blueapron.com slash twit. Uh, let's start the show with a little Windows 10. We haven't talked about that in a while. I don't really. It's about time. <laughs> about time. What do you, what yeah, do you well, got? This week, we, we um, found out when we think the launch of Windows 10 is going to be. Well, we know it's this summer. Well, we know a little more Could now. Could you be more thanks, specific? <laughs> <laughs> thanks to AMD CEO Lisa Su, we know more. <laughs> ah, what, she, she inadvertently uh, said something? She she was talking on the AMD analyst call and she mentioned with, <laughs> with the Windows 10 launch at the end of July, blah, blah, blah. Oh, my. So... Oh, I bet she's now getting a little uh, spanked by now yeah. by Redmond, don't you think? But now everyone's trying to guess. Did, it, did she say it as though, hey, we know it yeah. is then? Or this is kind of a... Does she literally think thing? July is the only month in summer? The month <laughs> July. That's a big... Um, uh, even saying summer is kind of a, an advance on what they had been saying, which was fall, right? It was, yep. July yeah, would be really kind of early. Yeah. Yes. So um, now this is setting off a wave of panic i would say because a lot of the testers who Mostly have been working with people have used the product <laughs> i was gonna say with people who are trying windows 10 yeah. are like july wait a minute that's not that far away especially for phone and the the state of windows 10 <laughs> mobile on phones is a little rugged how's that <sighs> word? Rugged. rugged wow <laughs> well at first it was no, no difference at all right i haven't played with the latest beta very much I see holes in my 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 home screen has black holes in it. I bet yeah, you could yeah. fix that. Yeah. It's rough. I, Is yeah. it? Rough. Yeah. It's oh yeah, that's right. I remember I got it's that dialogue to sign up and I couldn't do anything. Yeah. Yeah, I do yeah, you know, Mary and I uh, Mary Joe and I were talking about this and I I think the consensus is something along the lines of they tend to overreact a little bit, you know. They they the big problem last time was that traditional PCs weren't served well by Windows 8. So let's overreact and, and make sure we get that one right. But we're going to script tablets and possibly phones this time. Um, <laughs> I don't think that was how they made the decision. But I, I think that's how they, it, it, it's how it looks right now. Now, anything could change. But, you know, I think on PCs, like a desktop type system, not a desktop form factor, but a, a system where you would use the desktop, a laptop as well. You know, Windows 10 looks pretty solid. But on a tablet, especially, I mean, Windows 10 is... Uh, kind of scary right now. It's not really looking very good. Um, so then the question becomes, you know, if if this end of July date is correct for launch, which I hear from my contacts, it is, um, what does that really right. mean? Does that mean RTM? Does that mean like there's some big party and they have a launch? Does it mean any <laughs> hardware is available at that point? <laughs> yeah. Um, yep. So we don't really know what the word launch means, but we think there is some kind of a milestone that's happening at the end of July. And, you know, I, I guess I'm not as panicked, even though I have yet to even install this test build on anything. But That explains why I, you're not panicked. That may explain <laughs> it. But, uh, but also, you know, what, what we do know is what 
they did la with the last build of Windows, Windows 8.1, and I think they did this with the Windows 8 also, is they declare RTM and then they keep revving it, right? They keep on making updates and right. fixes. So they do when you, as well. Did they? Yeah, okay. So yeah. when yeah. you get the your new PC, the first thing that happens or one of the first things is you get all these updates delivered down to your PC of all the things that they've fixed and updated since they actually RTM the code, right? I think that's what's going to happen again. They're going to just keep revving and revving, updating, fixing. Whenever they declare RTM, it's still going to keep going. And by the um, way, I think that is going to happen again and keep going like yeah. that forever. Yeah. I think that's the plan. I mean, these guys yeah. have been around for a while. It's not their first time to the rodeo. Presumably, no. they know when it'll be ready, and they're not. And it would be a huge. I mean, look, they can't afford to release. This has to be good, because yeah. uh, well, does it, Leo? I think it has. <laughs> it, this is a lot. To, don't is not a lot riding on Windows Ten. It seems yes, to me. A lot. Am is I not? On you know what? Though? But actually, if you step back and think about it. It has to be right for Windows 7 users, right? I think that's job one, and it should be job one. Just because as that's the audience that they stand in. Just as Windows 7 was right for XP I mean, users, the people who had skipped Vista. This is yeah. the, the Windows 8 right, skippers. Right. But, but yes. imagine for a moment that, and I really don't think this is how they think of it, but imagine, if you would, if they uh, said, we're, we're going to de-emphasize how it works on a tablet or, or a phone. We're not going to worry about that as much. If, if it takes us six more months to figure that one out, it doesn't matter. I mean, who are they really screwing over there? It's a fairly small audience of people who already are Windows fan and or Windows tablet fans, right? Um, compared to, say, the hundred, several hundred million, possibly close to a billion users who uh, are on Windows 7 or uh, an unsupported version of Windows XP. Mm hmm you know, I mean, it's a big yeah. deal for us. You know, we care about the stuff. Mary Jo and I happen to use Windows Phone and we like it uh, and we want it to be great on Windows 10 and all that stuff. But I mean, honestly, uh, what's the what's the fear here? Are they if, what if they do get it wrong? Are they apps? Yeah. Well, uh, phone, I guess it doesn't matter because, well, I don't want to be, well, I don't want to be rude, but. <laughs> no, but it's that's true of Windows tablets 3%. as well. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody really uses it. Um yeah. But, but, you know, the phone one, at least there's some built-in delay, right? Like, so when Microsoft yeah. RTMs Carriers Windows Phone, then yeah. who knows how many months we're all going to be waiting for Verizon, AT&T, and everyone else. Are know? they compelled I mean, to release it all at once? Have they kind of made such a big deal about that that they don't have a choice? No. They I haven't They haven't said that on the record, actually, that it's all the Windows 10 variants that launch together. But because they're so emphasizing this universal core, universal app idea, I would think that would be the goal. Except so, for uh, uh, HoloLens, no, right? But Yeah, two. I mean, two things to that. One is, I, I, I can't find this, but I believe they said that the Internet of Things version would ship at the same time as other okay. versions of Windows 10, you know, whatever. Yeah. Um, that doesn't really impact this discussion too much, but I believe they said that. Um, the other thing is, you know, when you talk about what does it mean to ship in July, I mean, maybe that means the core part of Windows 10 that is common across all of those versions. And then that they kind of start releasing the actual productized versions of Windows 10 subsequently. Mm. Uh, you know, maybe, maybe that's what so. July is. No, I don't think so either, but I'm not, <laughs> you know, just, just as a possible. Uh, no. It's a theory, but no. <laughs> no. Yeah, yeah I, I actually but, don't think that's true, but, but, I, remember, but it's a possibility. Here, here's... Here's something else we know that we haven't really been bringing into the, the into the discussion, but we do believe there's going to be a summer release of Windows 10 and a fall release, like the major, more major releases, right? So there's going to be this thing, let's say end of end of July, and then there's going to be another thing we think in October that's going to be another big kind of update to Windows 10 with lots of little updates in between. Maybe it's Windows 10 to OEMs and the launch is July, and maybe October is when you start seeing the new PCs and all that. Maybe, but I still think they're trying to hit back to school. Um, and if they are, well, July, July and July is yeah. the back to school deadline. <laughs> it is. Really? Yeah. It's kind of late for back to school. It's late, honestly. I know. I mean, well, a lot of times is. you see the back to school specials when kids are graduating from school, which doesn't happen in July. It happens in May, June. Wow. Um, but what yeah, better than October? If it is end of July, what's the time frame going forward now? Don't they have to start doing gold masters and things? I mean, when does that, what, what goes on next? Mm -hmm. Well, they have to declare it feature complete. That's not um, happened yet, obviously. If no. it has, then um, people have a right to get angry. 
<laughs> I've heard people speculating at Build there next week they're going to say That's this. I would <laughs> be very surprised. <laughs> Very There's surprised. a bigger chance that the Loch Ness monster is real than that. That's gonna happen. <laughs> <laughs> could um, they have been yeah, holding so have back? Could they have been holding back versions that are much more feature complete? And yeah. well, I don't I've know why they would do you know, that. that but I, by the I way, I, this is that's the kind of rationalization you use when the thing that holds power over you is seen as some intelligent, all-encompassing. You know, Borg type thing where they they they're so much smarter than we are, yeah. and and they clearly they're holding something back, <laughs> and they're gonna just blow us away. <laughs> and uh, well, I would yeah, love yeah. to believe that that's true. I really <laughs> almost need for that to be true, but I, I don't. Yeah. I, oh yeah. God, that would that would be great, but I just yeah. don't. No, yeah. I just don't see it. no. I mean, it's going to just be, I think the next thing that happens is you declare it feature complete, you stop, and maybe they already have stopped allowing anyone to add new code that adds a new feature, and everybody's just focused on fixing it at that point, right? And then you sure. declare RTM, goes to OEMs, goes out to MSDN and TechNet, and the Windows Insiders, I guess. and But still gets, keeps getting updated. And I think that's the key. Right. And by the way, regardless of July, August, September, I don't care what the date is, I really do think that's a key part of this Windows 10 strategy that... RTM is is not the hard line milestone it used to be. It's really just one of many steps, and it's important for various reasons. But really, it, it gets improved past then. And like Mary Jo said, they've done it before. They did it on phone. They're going to do, it, if anything, more with Windows 10 than they did in the past. Yeah, I've had people ask me who are business users, "What about us?" Right? So we can't take this code that they call RTM if it's not great. But you know. How many business users on day one are going to be like, hey, I want right. Windows 10. It's just RTM today. There, that doesn't happen. I mean, when a business, right. uh, especially a bigger enterprise, decides to move to a new operating system, there's months of like planning and testing and yeah. testing your apps. And they're not going to rush out. Pretending that we're going to roll this out and then never rolling it out. There's all kinds yeah. of things that would prevent a business right. from actually doing this. But actually, right. you know, you mentioned earlier this notion of a, two releases of Windows 10, essentially, in, in, in 2015. And if you think back to Windows Vista, they did a, a business launch in, I want to say, November. And then the consumer launch was probably February or whatever the following year. And so there was some number of months between them. You know, you might look at the Windows 10 launch this year as the opposite of that, where the consumer one would go out first because we want to head back to school. And consumers are more willing and uh, more used to this notion of constant updating because we see that all the time on our phones. And that maybe by the time that second thing happens in October or whenever that is, that's the version where they say, if you're in businesses now, it's okay to move from evaluation to actual deployment. Yeah. That sounds plausible. It's clearly never going to happen, but it sounds like. <laughs> yeah. So I, I'd say to people who are saying there's no way this is going to happen in July, that must be wrong. I think it's right. And I think it is going to happen at the end of July. And I don't know, again, if, if this means like a big formal um, kind of launch thing like they have with Windows 7 and Windows 8, or if this just means RTM. I don't, uh, but I think that date is correct. Wow. Based on what I've heard. Wow, wow, wow. Too soon. Paul, Paul's just shaking his head. <laughs> but Paul, they too know too what soon. they're doing. Don't you trust them? <laughs> that, wow. <laughs> no, I mean, I'm not being Don't facetious. I trust them? No. <laughs> Okay. Well, it would be okay. Look, this is too big. You don't. I'm not kidding. It would not be good to release prematurely. No. Okay. Somebody so in the chat room the says, "Why don't you just wait till it's done and then release it?" Well, oh, because it's not do. 1979. <laughs> I, you know. Yeah. I, look, no. I mean this. I mean this honestly. I don't mean this sarcastically. Mobile first, cloud first, right? All of these Android apps and iOS apps and all that kind of stuff that Microsoft is doing. I think we may need to accept the very harsh reality here that it's actually not important that they get this right, that getting this thing out early will appease certain people, fixing it constantly will fix will help other people, but that the reality is the personal computing market, not for desktop computers and laptops and things necessarily, but personal computing, the mass market for personal computing, has kind of moved on you know, from Windows. And so it might not be as important as we're trying to make it sound. I mean, yeah. I don't really think that this thing is core to the future of Microsoft. Oh. It's core to what they're doing right now, but it's, oh. I know it, but it's I know. increasingly less core as we go forward. It is. It's the third largest business at Microsoft out of five. Windows, 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 yep. yeah, form, formally Windows. number one, right? <laughs> 
Only yeah. number office. one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and ten. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the office wow. is number one, and yeah. uh, then enterprise stuff like right. all of, you know the cloud, yeah. Azure database, and blah blah blah. That's number two. Windows is three. Think, think about um, we just. Uh, I could talk about this, right? Uh, so, um, <laughs> you know, Microsoft just did, I guess, I'm sorry, I've been traveling a lot. I'm can a I, lot of Can it. I um, talk about this, as Paul? <laughs> Mary yes, Jo, tell me. Can I, can I you say may this? speak. Um, when Microsoft, they did talk about this. Yeah. So when Microsoft talked about um, the Office apps, the Office Universal apps for Windows Phone, they also gave kind of a general update about Office, you know, how they see Office across devices. Because one of the confusing things that's happening in Windows 10 is that if you get a Windows 10 computer, you could conceivably have two different versions of Office on there. You could have the universal apps, which are essentially mobile apps, and you could have the full desktop suite. And they want to make sure that people aren't confused by this. The positioning of the Office desktop application suite, or Office as most of us think of it, is A, the most powerful version of the suite, of course, but it's also the one that kind of targets the smallest possible market because so few people need that kind of functionality, right? Most people will be well served by the functionality in Word, Universal App, you know, Excel, PowerPoint, Outlook, and OneNote. Some people may need Publisher, that's in the desktop suite. Some people may need some of the more advanced features of Excel, let's say, um, or of Word. And, they, they, and Microsoft referred to them as authors, professional content creators, I mean, they're sort of like the productivity version, uh, uh, like Office productivity version of Photoshop users, right? Where it's it's a business, it's a big business, but the the slice of the personal computing market that needs that is actually very small compared to the broader market. And I think that's an interesting way just to look at Windows in general, because when you look at the Windows uh, desktop in particular, um, yeah, there are some... Today, 1.5 billion people use Windows PCs. There are some hundreds of millions of people using Windows 7. But as we go forward, those numbers decline, and the numbers of people using uh, smartphones and tablets go up. And I, I, you know, I mean, I personally need this stuff, and I like it. And I think a lot of people listening to this do as well. But I think, you know, 90 something percent of the people out there who have any use of a personal computing device do not need a full powered office. 2016 for desktop they just don't need it yep. and uh, that's windows isn't it isn't that windows i mean they just don't need it you know uh, microsoft's caught a little bit uh too by the fact that the iteration uh for software in other respects is much higher much faster android you know new yep. cycles all the time yep. Yep. this started in the late 90s with a guy named kent beck who created a concept called extreme programming <laughs> and it took over. It was basically, it's the Agile methodology. And it's what Mark yeah. Zuckerberg uh, says uh, for Facebook. He says, move fast and break things. And the idea... Oh, I remember, uh, Netscape called it internet speed. Yeah, the idea is get a product out. Um, right. And then uh, iterate over time, rapidly iterate, because the tools allow you to do that. As you get feedback from users and you see how they use it, you can iterate, you can improve it. Yeah. It makes a way, lot of sense for web apps and cloud apps, and that's how, that's why Google's constantly in beta. They're saying, in effect, this isn't the final version. We're iterating. But it's a little weird for an operating system because the well, whole point of an operating what, uh, system is it's a steady platform yeah, in which to build. It, well, the, the whole point of an operating system was, you know, was. I think that by making Windows 10 work like a mobile operating system, like a cloud service or whatever, makes sense. And that, you know, the only the only way that July makes any sense at all is if the back end of this is happening as well. Um, you know, in other words, that we're going to keep updating it over and over. And, you know, again, if you use Chrome OS, before. you're in that environment. Chrome OS is constantly updated. You don't even see it. But right. but in the background, maybe every morning you're going to get a new version of that operating system. And Google Windows is, is tough because Windows is lo there's a lot of legacy there. And, exactly. And Windows will also update itself in the background a little bit. But the truth is you do see it, you know, and you see it in, in forms that are not always welcome. Uh, we're going to reboot your computer. You better start shutting exactly. stuff down. And yeah. Sometimes you have a chance to uh, fix that stuff, and sometimes you don't. It's the reason why on the Apple platform on the Mac, they've added the ability for um, autosave on documents, so that if the system has to reset itself, you're not going right. to lose everything. And people don't know, but Apple is, is also pushing stuff out fairly frequently, invisibly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Although no, it's a big. It's by the way, I, I you can't understate the 
uh, difficulty of moving something like Windows, this giant monolithic thing, to a, to this. If there's anything that's antithetical to it is, Agile, it's, <laughs> it's Windows. You know, <laughs> it's a, it's a Titanic. It's loose. It's a giant ship. It's, it's the Exxon tournament. Valdez. I'm trying to pick <laughs> ships that haven't sunk. I'm sorry. Um, it's a big. They're trying to turn the big ship. It's a big ship. Yep. Yep. Um, so it's an inter. It's a, uh oh. Just Paul. Something strange is happening to Paul. Uh oh. <laughs> uh -oh. <laughs> um, <laughs> We're getting back in a second. Hey, just as Paul's reconstituting <laughs> in, in the uh, in the uh, uh, transformer um, transporter, let us mention very briefly that during as the show began, Google announced its uh, um, official wireless solution. We've been hearing rumors that Google was going to do this for some time. They're calling it Fi F I, mm. and it will um, aggregate connectivity from Sprint and T-Mobile. Um, in a very interesting way, you have to have a Nexus 6 to use it. Pricing is, of course, very affordable. We'll talk a lot about this on This Week in Google next um, uh, as we learn more about it. But um, right now, invite only. Um, and uh, the, it's an interesting. They have a one plan, one price. You $20 a month. You get talk, text, Wi-Fi, tethering, international coverage in 120 countries. That's 20 bucks a month. And then $10 per gigabyte for cellular data. U.S. and abroad, and you just pay as you go. Nice. So ten bucks for three, thirty bucks for three gigs, fifty bucks for five gigs, that kind of thing. Um, really, kind of uh, an interesting uh, slice on uh, mobile. You have to the big negative. You have to have a Nexus Six, which no one has. <laughs> I have one. <laughs> um, so that'll be uh, that'll be very interesting. Um, more details on uh, this week in Google. Paul's back. Sorry about that. It's okay. He's Paul's traveling around rural Pennsylvania <laughs> looking for a college. I think there's like an Amish guy out there making butter and it's powering the internet connection. <laughs> no, no. You're in part of the most beautiful part of the world. I love yeah. it out there. And uh, It is pretty. Yeah, yeah it's so it gorgeous. Um, did you see the, uh, the, the blog post on Metro? And, yes. Uh, oh, I yes. thought that was kind of interesting. In fact, well, I guess you wrote about it. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, this is the type of stuff I live and die on, you know, the <laughs> the whole, uh, the the how the sausage gets made kind of stuff. Um, and this was it's a, very interesting. This was a guy who worked at Microsoft, or yeah, he's still there. He was like a design lead on Windows Phone. Okay. Um, no, he works at Twitter now. Okay, so he can tell Do the we truth. We know who this is. He was on Reddit, right? Yeah, his name is actually out there. So one of the videos he links to, it's him giving a, a speech when he worked at Microsoft talking about some of the issues with, uh, you know, the phone interface. It's actually, I don't remember his name. I didn't use it in the article, yeah. but um, yeah. yeah, his name is out there. So what's so what, what do we learn? Well, I mean, long story short, because yeah, you certainly could read the post I wrote about it. You could read the whole Reddit chat if you want to. Um, I find this stuff to be kind of fascinating. Me too. My whole, Me too. My whole thing with Windows Phone has always been that and the reason that I was attracted to Windows Phone in the very beginning was that it wasn't just different, right? Which have been, it's easy to be different. You know, you look at iOS, you look at Android and you say, well, we're not going to be like that. We're going to be different. But being different for different sake is ridiculous. You know, being different and being better to me was what attracted me to Windows Phone. The problem with Windows Phone is that this, a lot of the things that I sort of thought of as being better were not necessarily better for everyone. Uh, and that's why we, we've seen over the subsequent years, Microsoft's had to scale back its plans for things like integrated experiences with third-party services, um, you know, uh, panoramic user interfaces and pivots and things like that. Um, because they're just unfamiliar to users. They're not necessarily efficient for certain types of tasks that people want to do a lot. And if you're a, um, I just think about something really simple. We're going to have a photos hub or a pictures hub where you can integrate the photos from all of your online services. And so if you have like Flickr and maybe you have a Google photos over here and you have OneDrive and whatever, whatever, search, Snapfish, whatever. Um, obviously, the Microsoft stuff's going to be in there. And there'll be one, in this case, it was one close Microsoft partner, uh, Facebook, that was in there. But these other services didn't want to integrate their brands into this thing that didn't promote their brand. You know, why would they? It's the type of thing that's good for users, but there's no benefit for the services to do it. You know, why do I want to make it easy to use photos on our service and photos from another service? I want you just to use our service. You know, one of the reasons that the monolithic uh, mobile app thing that you see on iOS and Android has taken off is that those uh, companies never forced or tried to force anyone 
to integrate into this, you know, system, which was very user friendly, uh, or at least potentially was, but wasn't very brand friendly. Um, and, you know, so that stuff kind of fell apart over the years. And the other thing, too, I guess, is just that, you know, uh, like I said, a lot of the things I, I, I looked at Windows Phone, especially with, before you could even use it yourself. You see it demoed and you think, wow, this thing's really amazing. They got it all right. And, um, you know, they didn't. <laughs> they didn't get it all right. And, uh, you know, here we are years later and obviously what happened happened. And so um, in some ways it's more important now that you give people a familiar experience rather than an unfamiliar experience that may or may not be better, you know, mm. because the first reaction that people have when they pick it up is like, what is this thing? You know, even if it is, you know, better. Oh, that's it's sad kinda, to me. I think, I, it, I think Windows Phone would do better if it had the apps people want. I really do. I, yeah. I, I don't I, know if I, it's because it looks different. I don't there's think, a lot, there's you know, a lot to it. It's not just that. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think it's true that it makes it easier on developers if, Windows Phone looks like Android and looks like iOS, right? Because then it's easier to make an app that you're already familiar with right. how things are, are aligned. But I feel like part of the of kind of the reason to get a Windows Phone was that it was different and that you liked the differences and that there were they kind of made the experience not so generic and cookie cutter. Yeah. 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 Um, so now we're taking that away because we need to try to get the app vendors involved. And we think maybe if we make it easier for them to build apps, maybe more will do it. Right? That's Boy, I feel like that's question. such a capitulation. I, I, I hate to yeah. see that. I yeah. really do. Yeah, I mean, then, it's, 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 there's a mix of things going on. I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, there are. There are. I, you know, then I, so much comes back to the hamburger menu. <laughs> it yeah, all yeah. comes back to the hamburger menu. Anyway, I have zero always... problem with the hamburger menu. I, I, I don't either. <laughs> one of the things. So, what does I, he I, say if, about the hamburger menu? <laughs> oh, a bunch of things. I mean, one is why you would have such a thing, when it's appropriate to have such a thing, uh, what a bit, and where, where you would put such this. a thing. Because we've had our yeah. own internal debates. You know, we're almost yeah. about to launch yeah. the new the, the website. The other thing he says, uh, he very emphatically says a couple of times, you know, people, this is not, we're going to do this because it's this way on Android. That is not the thinking. Um, he basically said it shouldn't surprise you to discover that there are great designers at different companies right. that have all arrived at the same destination because it is the right destination. You know, that you try different things and then what you realize is, you know, frankly, we really do have to go this way. The hamburger menu makes sense for uh, a mobile system where you have limited real estate, right. but you have a lot of commands right. and you got to put them somewhere. You don't want it to be something that the user taps on or clicks easily or by mistake. It has to be a little out of reach because it's by nature. It's supposed to be for things you don't need a lot. Uh, and not all apps need it or should have it. You know, something like Twitter, for example, is a simple app. There's, there's only a couple of dozen commands in Twitter, so you don't need a hamburger menu. But he said, uh, you know, something like Microsoft Word or Microsoft Excel. So what, are you kidding me? He said, this thing has, uh, has thousands of commands. You can't. I, he, says, you know, he, he said at one point, he said, I challenge you to come up with a user interface that works better than this. What are you, you going to have, a bunch of toolbars, you know, covering half of the screen? Like, it doesn't make sense on a mobile device. Yeah. Um, you know, and then there's issues around positioning and whether people, you know, use a phone with one hand or two hand and what does that look like? And there's, there's been a lot of user research into that stuff. And, and it's not, you know, some guy on a throne in the clouds making decisions. Yes, it is. It's <laughs> <laughs> We can now well, tell the truth. Maybe it is a Leo. <laughs> I am sitting on a throne right now. <laughs> it's like a cloud goes by. Yeah. Um, so are, so I, they I, don't I use the thing. hamburger, or they do use the hamburger menu for office uh, on they mobile. Do, of course they do. For they mobile, have they have to. They have to. But here's the thing. So uh, one of the things that I think actually scales pretty well, uh, and one of the things that is going to be kind of successful in Windows 10 is this notion of universal apps where the UI, the user experience, kind of scales to the size of the screen and to the orientation of the screen. Works whether it's a touch screen or isn't a touch screen. You know, maybe using a, uh, a mouse and a keyboard to interact with it. And if you look at the apps we've seen so far in Windows 10, like uh, Photos, Outlook Calendar, and Outlook Mail, um, Maps, uh, and a few others where you can use it on a tiny screen, like a four and a half inch Windows phone screen. You can use it on a tablet. You can use it on a big desktop computer with a 27 inch screen or whatever. Um, as it turns out, those apps actually scale pretty well. So uh, that uh, it's not a miracle, but I mean, that's it's pretty impressive that that's even possible. So I kind of quibble around um, certain aspects of the Windows 10 UI. I don't like some of the controls and things like that. But as far as the general theme of it and having it work across, you know, a very um, d 
di very different kinds of devices. It does seem like they've done something pretty impressive there. And by the way, it involves a hamburger menu. You know, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, yeah. It's just like that's part of it. Who says they don't like the hamburger menu? I mean, why are we fighting this battle? Is it is it is it controversial? Leo, here's why. This no, this is a very good reason not to like the hamburger menu. And this is this is what it, you hear from all of the people that don't like it. And it, it it's this. I just don't like it. <laughs> I don't like yeah. it. You know, yeah. it really does. But, or, yeah. or in the Windows world, what you'll hear is, but I liked pivots. I liked no, panoramas. No, 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 no. I liked metro, you know, whatever, right. however you want to say it. I mean, you know, there's change that. Change is bad. And there's some, you know, I don't know how somebody could get into the technology space and not like change. But somehow somebody did get in who doesn't like change. Because <laughs> the technology space is about change. And really, the people who are on the cutting edge of technology I would think should embrace change. That's one of their. That's kind of the only constant. Yeah. Um, I feel like my, Microsoft did so much to evangelize why Metro was better, the right. design language, right. right? They they were like, this is why it's so much better than what iOS and Google have, and yep. everybody started getting on board, like, yeah, it's better. And now it's like, hey, we're redoing Metro oh, the I get it. design because language. I, totally I, by the way, I, I, I could <laughs> go back to my the original stuff that I wrote about Windows Phone. I was completely on board with everything, but the one thing that actually set me off a little bit was. Uh, it was like Albert Schum and those guys on and on, like lots of talk, designerly talk. Yep. Uh, you know, it, they they talked about, you know, they talked in terms that, you know, you just don't hear out in the normal world. It was, it was all about design and design and design and design. It's good design, it's good design. And, you know, I asked um, openly at the time, if this is such a good design, why do you have to keep telling us it's such a good design? <laughs> That's a bad you know, sign. <laughs> I just, it, 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 it was over-explained so much. You know, it's yeah. like, you just don't understand it, you heathen. Like, if you just, there's, there's a reason. There's like a gutter on the side of the Windows Phone 7 screen. Like, it, this is like a design thing. And people were like, why aren't you using the whole screen? You know, and they would say, yeah. because it, yeah. it, it, it gives you this emphasis where you can tell that this, you know, maybe there's something over there. And you could, and they're like, yeah, but why don't you just use the whole screen? <laughs> you know, <laughs> and I, I think there are things that are sort of, I don't know what you call that. They're supposedly good design, but I think we as humans can just look at something and say, yes, this is attractive. Yes, this is usable. Yes, this is whatever. And um, I, I actually think that the way that they had to overemphasize or overexplain the design was maybe the first warning sign that something was wrong. Yeah. I don't know what to say now. Okay. I know. Maybe we should get Carl. A little, a little <laughs> diversion. Let's get Carl. Carl. All right, well, <laughs> Carl's give us some good Let's news. Get Carl. Some good news. Um, we're going to take a break uh, while we get Carl. <laughs> and I guess the people who get Carl will be getting Carl while I take a break. <laughs> Our show today brought to you by Linda.com. We love Linda. Apparently LinkedIn loved Linda, too, to the tune of, what was it, $1.6 billion? Don't worry. Fear not. The, the uh, Linda.com you love is only going to get better and better and better. Already 3,000 on-demand articles, videos, really, video courses. I, I'll tell you why I call them articles, because it's the, just to say the video, it's so much more. There's, there's worksheets, there's study uh, guides, there's transcripts, so you can search through uh, the videos to find exactly the part you want in almost every area of technology, of business, of creativity... If you're a curious mind, if you like to learn, if you're a problem solver, maybe you just need to get a you know an improved job or, or, or get some recognition at your current job, lynda.com. We use lynda.com at Twit to train our editors in uh, Premiere. I use it at home. The photography courses are remarkable. Photoshop, uh, the new Photoshop just came out. Linda will have courses almost right away because they work with the publishers to make sure that the training is available day and date. You're going to learn from top experts, people uh, like my friend Ben Long, uh, who's a great photographer and a great teacher, Bert Monroy, who's the king of Photoshop, and also a wizard. Ben's is a learn to be a better photographer, which is so awesome. He also does the uh, Foundations of Photography and the Photography 101 series. You'll learn about composition, exposure, all the basics, and then as you get more advanced... Portraits, landscapes, street photography, travel photography. I got to I gotta take that one before we uh, take our vacation. Um, Time-lapse shots. Ben has a great one on macro photography. 
He's not the only teacher, but just let me just use this as an example. This is the his course on uh, introducing the practicing photographer. It's kind of as if, you know, if you want to make a living doing this, as Ben does, here's what you need to know. Choosing a camera, looking at the light as a subject, using a small reflector for fill, and on and on. Compositing street photography and all of that. Now, wouldn't you like to be able to watch this entire course for free? Well, you can when you go to lynda.com slash windows. We're going to give you a free 10-day trial. For 10 days, you have the run of the place. Everything, all 3,000, what is it, 3,497 courses. The new Lightroom uh, just came out. Of course, the new Lightroom course is out. Chris Orwig's course for uh, Creative Cloud, folks. But notice they do two, one for the standalone Lightroom, one for Creative Cloud. I love that. Photo retouching, color correction. Download the tutorials and watch them on the go. You get access on your Android or iOS device as well. Um create playlists of courses you want to watch, customize your learning path, share it with colleagues, team members. They have business courses too, resume, building communication, negotiation, data analysis. Boy, that's a hot topic. If you knew how to do that, I think you could get a much better job, let me tell you. <clears throat> Lynda.com, lynda.com slash windows, 10 days free, wait for you. You can browse around accounting fundamentals, up and running with Excel, up and running with Tableau. I don't even know what that is. Access, essential training. You got to love it. LYNDA.com slash Windows. Try it today. You'll love it. All right. Let me see. I'm going to press the magic buttons here. And lo and behold, someone has appeared in between Paul and Mary Jo Flo <laughs> Flowley. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's Carl Franklin. Hi, Carl Franklin. Hi, Mary Jo. <laughs> Hi, Carl. Hi, Paul. I've always wanted to do the hey, Brady man. Bunch thing. Oh, well, hey. Right. <laughs> How are you? Do you want Good. to introduce him, or I shall will. I? All right. I will. Um, we've had Carl okay. Franklin on the show before. I think it was a year ago. Was right? I here? Yeah. Remember the you Bourbon were Brothers? Oh, I was drunk. I remember. That. <laughs> Richard Campbell and Carl. Oh. Franklin. Little little Blanton's there. Oh yes, sir. This I'll show say, brought to you say, by an almost empty <laughs> bottle of Blanton's. I say, son, you know, you know how to drinks. All right. <laughs> yeah. Remember they they were the dot net rocks guys. They they have a podcast right. called Dotnet Rocks. They have of other course, shows too, course, like the tablet course. show and um, Carl does more than that though. He's also very knowledgeable about Visual Basic and I think he's a Microsoft MVP still, right? Yeah. Yep. 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 For Connect, yes. Yep. Regional director. I'm most of a C sharp developer these days, but wow. um, that's saying a lot. Well, okay. I don't want to go down that rabbit hole, but you know, <laughs> VB, VB contributed a lot to programming, as we know. Contributed a lot to .NET. Uh, it just fell out of favor, mostly because mm -hmm. of Microsoft being C programmers. You know, they thought of VB as a sort of an afterthought. I that's think that's kind of a shame. Mostly with code examples. You, you could do rapid and keeping up in technologies. So well. With VB, you know, that's yeah. a shame. Yeah. yeah, but we we thought it would be great to have Carl on for one reason because Build is next week, and you know it's yeah. all about developers and who better than oh, a first, developer? I got to say something to uh, Paul. Paul, mm -hmm. for the best yes, shoe sir. fly fly and shoe fly pie in Lancaster, you want to go to Dutch Haven. Nice. nice. Dutchhaven.com. You can even order. I have no affiliation with them. I don't even like shoe fly pie. I'm just telling you that's can the I place. <laughs> Table You're taking advice on shoe fly pie from a guy who doesn't like shoe fly pie. No, no, I don't <laughs> eat it. I can't really eat like that. But, but I have, yeah. and I've had it from Dutch Haven, and it's yum yum. That's well, where the Amish go. The right, the right place. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> yep. Right up in your buggy. All right. Yep. So build shoe fly pie. Yeah, build. Yeah. Like, so we're build. Trying to figure um, out what you know? What what do we, what do you think? What is build? Can, could you explain that to us, please? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can actually. Build is what the PDC used to be for. The yeah. Professional Developers Conference for future-looking technology coming from Microsoft. Um, whereas Tech Ed was now Ignite, I think. Tech Ed was yeah. about current stuff, more IT than developer, but still current stuff. Okay. Yeah. And here's I, the good news. This year builds all about Connect. Yeah. I'm so excited. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in in a lot of ways, there's a there's would, a big you know with was, Hololens and stuff from the Connect team. Joking. Well, you're <laughs> right though. I mean, Hololens, Hololens is the Connect is exciting. team. I want Hololens. Yeah. Yeah. 
Good stuff. Yeah. Well, yeah. I think that it's very likely that we're going to see more cross-platform stuff announcements at Build. I and I here's why I deduce this, and it's just my opinion that you know in November last year, Microsoft announced the .NET Core framework being open sourced, uh, powers web apps using ASP.NET libraries, going to be open sourced on Windows, Linux, and Mac OS. What does that mean? You know, that means clearly something's up in the cross-plat. Uh, Miguel de Acaza from uh, Xamarin, who, who championed the Mono Project, he was once reviled by Microsoft, especially the Windows uh, operating system division. He's one of the three directors now of the .NET Foundation, which is an independent organization that exists to foster open development and collaboration around the, uh, the Microsoft.NET developer framework. So in an interview with him in the register last November when this announcement came out, I think you can see it at tinyurl.com slash Miguel on .NET, D-O-T-N-E-T. He says that <laughs> Microsoft's opening of, the f opening of the full .NET framework gives a nice read-only benefit to the community. It's very much tied to Windows, has lots of other dependencies, but the .NET Core that's very much, is very much open for porting. And that's all based on PCL or portable class libraries, which make it possible to go from platform to platform. And that's w why uh, Xamarin is so successful, because they have these uh, PCL, basically, wrappers that talk to Android and iOS uh, so they can do cross-platform development. So I know there's stuff going on there. I, th I think you're going to see stuff coming out, but I have no idea what it's going to be. Yeah. Um, for IoT and devices, you guys already touched on this a little bit about Windows 10, but they've already announced that Windows 10 will be free on certain size devices, right? Yeah. They've already shown yeah. us a couple of their own hardware platforms. I expect to see more of those. Not only that, but for around 150 bucks, I don't know you guys talked about the Windows PC on a stick. You mm, search yeah. for Intel Compute Stick, 150 bucks. Yep. It's got a quad-core Atom processor, 2 gigs of RAM, 32 gigs of flash, has room for a full-size USB 2 port, a micro SD card slot, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, um, graphics and audio are also built in. It basically is a stick with an HDMI plug, like a Chromecast or something, but it's a full PC. So I think that... Uh, and just to put that into context, Google and Asus are teaming up on a sub $100 dongle called Chromebit that's due out this summer. And that promises to turn a TV or monitor into a Chrome OS-based computer. So it says a lot about where Microsoft wants to take Windows, I think, that all these small devices in the IoT store, I think that's going to be a really big one at Build. What do, what do you guys both think the giveaway is going to be at Build? Like, what's your <laughs> guess that, you know, there's always I something I have a wish. Good. Okay. Yeah, is, what? Hol is a hollow lens the wish? Oh, of course, uh, that's the wish. No, you know, that's I'm, not I'm ready. so yeah. yeah, I know, but uh, that's the wish. You know, <laughs> but I'm I'm so excited to see I don't, what I don't that. See that? I bet they let do. people buy it at a reduced cost. I bet that's how that, that works. That's probably more like it. Like and I'm hoping they just have prototypes to play with at the show. That'll be oh, enough yeah. for me. I think I that's important. Will. Yeah. Yeah, I bet. They yeah. Will. Yeah. I bet it's. I bet, I bet, I bet they give away Surface Three. Yeah, Surface Three, man. That would be great. Oh. Have you guys talked about the Surface 3? Mm -hmm. um, we have on that, other shows, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's like a, what, a $400 baseline price Surface. But for me, I need the pen and I need Wi-Fi and yeah. I need more storage and stuff. So by the time I got done specking one out for me, <laughs> it was like 900 bucks, <laughs> $1,000, yeah. yeah. which is still better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. still yeah. better. But yeah. Oh, and as far as HoloLens, though, I did hear from someone close to the project that the experience of HoloLens for real it's pretty much exactly like what you see in those videos. Those videos weren't doctored in any way. Yeah, we, we so got that's to try the HoloLens. Yeah, we did use yeah, it. Paul and I did. Yeah. Oh, great. Yeah, back in January, yeah. yeah. It is. It's a, It's a, And I went in almost, not mocking it, but just expecting it to be terrible and yeah. walked out a true believer. Like, it's actually really pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Yeah, I'm, so, yeah, I'm should, very excited about good. that. Yeah. Me and it's my guys said... <laughs> Yeah, Leo, they, they, Leo's looking through a box it. of animal crackers. <laughs> <laughs> hey, but it works. <laughs> oh, Leo! By the way, I would be honored to create a new theme song for you. There's a trove of metalheads who frequent the studio who'd be honored to bang their collective heads for Twit. It's uh, it's completely. We we take it if you make it. We take it, and we should say that you do a lot of interesting musical stuff uh, as well. I do, yeah, including music yeah. to uh, program by. Yeah, music to code by. That uh, it really all starts with 
and I'm going to go deep here, Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs, mm -hmm. uh, which has been in the news a lot lately, but it's been around for a while. And uh, Wi-Fi, we've about added on, Wi Fi to the bottom line. Uh, that's number one. The pyramid's actually. a little taller than it used to be with Maslow. <laughs> we have Wi Fi and then all that other happiness, satisfaction. Crap. Right. Yeah. So at the very bottom of the level that everybody needs is wi -Fi. basic <laughs> needs food, sleep, shelter, and Wi Fi. Wi -Fi. Uh, then we have safety <laughs> needs <in> that order. <laughs> being and feeling safe, both being and feeling, because those are two different. Social needs, love and belonging would be level three. Level four, esteem needs, positive self image, that kind of thing. And level five is self actualization. Maslow called the, those experience peak experiences. But uh, this other guy comes around in 1990, writes a book, Mihai Chikzen Mihai. How's that for a pronunciation? It's an Americanization, I know. I actually he was inspired. Interviewed, I interviewed him. When really? Flo, when Flo came out, yeah. Oh, great. And well, I never could I, get his name right either, so. <laughs> yeah. He just says, call me Mihai. That's all right. Mm -hmm. It's Michael, basically. <laughs> He's awesome. Uh, he, and Flo he was is an inspired awesome by Maslow. Yeah, he was inspired by Maslow, and he developed this idea of flow, which, as you probably have said before, it's like a state of mind where you're doing an activity where there's constant feedback, and it's very pleasurable, and you sort of lose yourself We've in your environment. We've all experienced it, or you, I hope you've experienced it, where just it could be playing tennis, it could be programming, it could mm. be, but where you just kind of, you're in the zone is another way. You're in the it. zone. Yeah, and musicians get this a lot, as you said, sports. Gamers get this a lot. Um, I think that's on, just on the dark what, that's side. Just flatlining, really, mostly. But yeah, right. <laughs> I'm always in that uh, mode. But please continue. <laughs> gamblers, yeah, that's why they gamble. Yeah. Right, gambling. Yeah, it's very much a flow activity. It might not be good for you, but uh, right. you get, your money flows out of your wallet pretty fast. I'm sure. <laughs> uh, developers have a particular problem with flow, though, and that's distraction. So this is what we were talking about. I was talking with um, uh, Mark Seaman on .NET Rocks, getting into the zone. Uh, this was in, at NDC last year. And he talked about the particular challenges developers have. Also, there's a sort of a fallacy that being in the zone is automatically more productive. That's not. Um, there are so many ways you can get distracted, you can get pulled out, and, and it's actually downright addicting. It can be. So we have these distraction problems, you know, especially the better you get at what you do, the more often people come to you with questions, problems, whatever, and the more interruptions you have. So managing your environment is a really good first step to, to contain yourself. Also, we talked on this podcast, it was great, about how what we used to do, I used to do as a developer when I was younger, is wreck myself, all-nighters, yeah. right? Yeah, me too. Up till four yeah. in the morning, yeah. which is great for flow. You don't want to stop. You got you it all in your head, stop. everything's going. The balls are in the right. air, you can't drop them. Exactly. Great for flow, but not so good for the rest of your life. So he has some suggestions in terms of getting into and out of, you know, when you want, be in control of it, which is really what inspired me to do music to flow, to music to code by, rather. Every program uh, I've music, ever seen, especially here, because they're all in open environments and cubicles and stuff, wear headphones. They all wear, you got yeah. it, that's, start, that's job one. Yeah. But what's in those Head headphones? <laughs> right. What's in those headphones? It's very rare, actually, that people listen to anything with lyrics or anything that's greater in tempo than about 90, yep. 100 beats per minute. That, that tends to be a very special person that can block out all that kind of noise. But most of us, uh, in that, there was actually a study here, uh, and there's a, I put up a link to it, that linked Baroque music that yeah. is about 50 to 80 BPM with focus and concentration. I've always listened to Baroque music when I wanted to think yeah but but the problem is not everybody likes classical music and so to some people it's like oh da -da 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 -da, you know and it whatever um, not everybody likes classical music so I mean I was brought up in the 70s you know listening to great grooves and jams and, stuff like that. and <laughs> absolutely <laughs> <laughs> yeah Kenny Rankin <laughs> yeah I mean you poor I, pathetic I, I, soul Actually, as a musician, especially as a jazz musician, people really look down on sort of soft jazz, yeah, you know, and yeah. I, I never really liked soft jazz. I liked the traditional hard stuff, but I liked the groovy stuff, too. Like, you know, like people say my music sounds like Steely Dan a lot, and that's because I love, they're really good at making that kind of music, yeah, you know? Yeah. But they're, they were just imitating other people. So, so we're listening I to music to Code By right now, right? Yeah, go ahead. Turn up a little. And if you if you feel like 
writing. Yeah, a, I can only listen to instrumental. A music tight loop, writing. maybe something with a yeah. kind of a wild framework. This is 80 BPM, but the challenge here was for me to make something that, la first of all, lasts a long time. And I picked 25 minutes for a reason. I'll tell you in a minute. But you you want it to be something that is fam gets familiar quickly, so it loops, but it can't be boring. It also can't be distracting. You know, so it, it's a fine line. And, and I had a, a Kickstarter campaign and I interacted with my backers to say, hey, what about this? What about this? And I got feedback. And a lot of the feedback was uh, that snare is just too distracting. You got to turn that down or those drums or, wow, that sound that's off on the left or whatever. Yeah, that's very distracting. Go take that out. Uh, it was more about taking stuff out than it was about, you know, what to put in. Um, so... So, but I came up with this great album of uh, three 25 minute pieces. I've since done two more. So those are all available and four minute samples are available too. And uh, like I said, uh, oh, the 25 minute thing came from the Pomodoro technique. So this is a technique That's of time a, management. Is that a technique for making tomato sauce? Well, <laughs> it's funny. It does. It is to, a Pomodoro, but it's basically the timer, oh. kitchen timer that ah, looks like a tomato. A tomato. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Oh. So, so you the did, idea you is did that a Kickstarter you, for this, didn't you? Yeah, I did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did you? It was okay. successful. Um, oh, that's great. Uh, I started by setting a goal of seventy five hundred dollars, and I think in thirty days, Richard yeah. Campbell was the one to to make me hit a ten ten grand. That's that's fantastic. It was. It, let me tell you something. It's the it's weird because it's the most lucrative musical project I've ever done. <laughs> that is mostly successful when people aren't listening to it. <laughs> That's when they like it the most. So, you know, it's kind of, uh, I had to take a lot of stuff out. But, you know, in the end, it's not music for listening. It's a productivity tool. Yeah. So the, as a Pomodoro technique, basically, do things in 25-minute increments, take five minutes to reassess. There's a lot of developers using this already. So they really like the fact. And, and here's the funny thing. The response has been unbelievable. Like, real results. People are tweeting I can't believe how time is flying by when I'm listening to this stuff and, and coding. I'm going to tell Steve Gibson about this because he actually does this with music that he's selected. I, th I can't remember what he mm -hmm. uses, but uh, he would love this because that's exactly when he's coding. Probably he's not Slayer. Not Slayer. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> not Slayer. There's uh, music from the Hearts of Space, which is a, 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 a wonderful website and a channel. There's yeah. some talk in that. You can do it without talk. Uh, and I don't. It's not specifically for for encouraging flow. This is the mm -hmm. most. This is the most perfect uh, example of this I've ever heard because it's just. Well, and that's what it's designed for. Yeah, you know, yeah. it's designed it to be long way. running. Doesn't get in the way. It never comes to the forefront of your consciousness, and yet it's not something that you uh, are entirely bored by either. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Mm. Nice. Yeah, so it's you bring and what, any handouts for build. Yeah, actually, I'm going to bring a bunch of CDs and hand them out. So you know, qu uh, corner me somewhere and I'll give you one. But uh, for now, you can go to mtcb.pwop.com and check it out there. Music to code by MTCB. And there's a sample uh, track heard, there you can hear, you know, uh, what it sounds Yeah, like. every one of them. If you go to the store, the download now or whatever, go to the store. Every one of them has a sample. Uh, all five of them. There's three on the CD, and then there's an extra two. But yeah, even reading the comments, someone, Steve Smith, who was saying how he, yeah, there he is, right there. He's saying how he had uh, these kids, little babies, and in the NICU, and putting this music on calmed them. Another guy uh, says it calms <laughs> his dog, his dog, <laughs> who's like pacing, and then sits down for the 25 minutes, and then 25 minutes is so he's pacing again, chasing his tail. <laughs> Weird. That's strange how, how it happens. That is great. Wow. Very cool. Nice. <clears throat> yeah, it's a surprise to me too, Leo. I, <laughs> I don't I, understand. Well, I've always listened to Baroque music because um, yeah. I like classical music. So I have a massive mm -hmm. collection of Baroque. I mean, literally yeah. massive collection of little known and, and that's Baroque wonderful. stuff. And it's, it is. It's nice. But it is a little bit more foreground than this. It is. This is soothing. I might fall asleep to this. My regret. yeah, yeah. My only fear. Yeah, it's so kind of relaxing. Something a little bit slower would probably put you to sleep. This, this is uh, seventy five. The 75? latest one five was seventy five. The first one was sixty. That one you're listening to is sixty. Okay. But you're saying you can give us some heavy metal for the show. 
Oh yeah, I do all kinds of music. <laughs> well, I'm looking at the stuff behind you in your in your studio, and it's obvious you you play quite a bit of stuff. This it looks like so you do, you record there. Yeah, it's it's a beautiful world class facility what a great. here. That is so nice. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I hear you want me to show you the rest of it. Yeah, you see. All right, here we go. Is this yours? Oh yeah. Oh man. I've been in there, haven't I, Carl? Yes, you have. Yeah, there's so there's a drum set and some more. Wow. Amps and stuff, and then I have a piano over here. Dot net been very, very good to me. That's my uh, <laughs> look at that. It's my uh, diner booth right there. I was gonna say it looks like a diner. Yeah. That's so a diner many booth. programmers yeah. are musicians. Uh, there's yeah, just that's true. Some natural, you know, mathematical ability and music just seem to go together. I've actually talked a lot about this. Um, yeah, there I am. Uh, I think that it's not only the abstraction, you know, and the ability to work with abstractions, which music is a huge abstraction over what we don't really know, but uh, but musical notation especially. Also practicing an instrument. If you practice an instrument, like, you know, piano or guitar or whatever, you have to produce music. You have to, like producing an app. It's a, it's a big picture. But you also have to zero in on these little technical details, you know, practice a run, a scale, a something that isn't big picture at all. It's a little technical detail, right. you know, Very doing a little test harness yeah. or yeah. something or Very writing or writing a routine, you know, you're honing those technical skills is critical, but you at the end of the day have to zoom out and see the whole thing as a piece of music. It's nice stuff. So a uh, music That's to code great. by mtcb.com. Is that right? dot pwop dot com p w o p dot pwop dot com pwop is the name of my studio and it's stand it's not uh, an acronym it actually is the sound of a forehead slap <laughs> so it's like that. pwop oh that's, my god that's a pwop I love it. yeah it's usually accompanied by its brother don't don't <laughs> cool that's that's what it means that's good cool jazz baby. so mtcb dot pwop dot com listen to the quiet storm mm. Carl Franklin coming yeah. at you beautiful Wednesday afternoon. If you use this for things that are inappropriate, I don't want to know. So don't email. <laughs> you could. You could. You don't a, tweet that, please. Kind of a slow jazz moment. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, baby. Come well, on. Well, you know, it's about focus thing, right? So. Yeah. Digging the fine sounds. <laughs> Carl Franklin. It's good. I like it. It's very yeah. evocative. It's, it's pretty cool. Yeah. The and it's chill and it stays out of the way. Yeah. The podcast also, let's not forget that, give you a big fat plug for a great show, the .NET, was it .NET Radio? .NET Rocks. .NET Rocks. Yeah. Rocks and so we've, rolls. We've done 1,100 some odd shows what? now. You We have been doing podcasts before there was podcasts. So really? 2002 is when we started. Wow. We should have called August you to uh, help defeat the podcast troll. You had prior art. That's all right. Podcast troll. Oh, you don't even know about him. Don't, don't, no, know. don't no. worry about it now. Okay. He's, he's been defanged by the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. Yeah, I, I, I don't really have a lot of advice for people except, you know, be early. That's probably the best <laughs> advice I can. <laughs> yeah. You know, be the first to do something, and you're pretty got a pretty good I have shot. I've never at understood it. the success of Twit, this show, and the other shows. They're they're really just people talking about stuff. But I right, think because right. we were the first, very early yeah. on. People, people grew attached like baby ducks. Yeah, I, there's some of that. <laughs> now we can't Absolute. lose. Them. Like baby everywhere. sloths, maybe. Baby sloths. <laughs> can you? Uh, can we? We should talk. I mean, I, we'll give you credit, whatever you want, but I would love something. What? Do you, Paul and Mary Jo should really Let's give you the specs. Somehow, I don't think Mary Jo is exactly the heavy metal rocker type. I'm not a metalhead. I, you'd you be surprised. Are... Really. <laughs> <laughs> Something about we don't know about Mary Jo? I think, no, I think Carl plays... I've heard a lot of Carl's music, and it's really interesting and good, and I think he could come up with something easily. Uh, yeah, I definitely would love to contribute well, there. You, you know these guys. You know Visual Basic, so I think that's pretty I'm much all you need. I'm thinking the intro to Romeo Delight by Van Halen, something, <laughs> something like that. All right. <laughs> I do know many a programmer that does listen to heavy metal. I don't think Miguel yeah. de Acaza is listening to a light jazz. <laughs> I really don't. But, but I you know, it depends. Some people yeah. can work with people screaming at them. I can't, I can't even I think can't. with people nope. screaming at me. No, nope. I can't. But uh, some yeah. people can. So it's a, to each his own. But uh, maybe it depends on your childhood and how much screaming you had to endure as a child. Yeah, yeah. You know? exactly. yeah. yeah or how much you right. did. I don't know. 
But anyway, uh, yeah, again, this episode brought to you by an almost empty <laughs> bottle of lanterns. <laughs> We're just going to wake you up for a little bit here. This is what Paul's looking for. Chugga, 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 chugga. This is the ringtone of my phone. Is it really? <laughs> <laughs> I have a, a, a Roxy Music song as the ringtone of my phone. And every time I hear Avalon, for some reason, I think the phone's ringing. I jump up. I had to stop Avalon. doing that. It's like a Pavlovian Avalon. response. Yeah, it is. Love that. Uh, That's kind of that, That's a great, that style, isn't song. it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of slow and groovy. Yeah. yeah. Wasn't anything like early Roxy Music. But that's right. a, that's a t conversation for another day. <laughs> yeah, wow, we could go down that one too. Are you going to come up sure. after build and join us uh, in the studio? You're welcome to if you'd like. I would love to, sure. So yeah. May Day, it's a special uh, edition of Windows Weekly. Not next week, but the uh, there is no show next week because uh, next you guys will be busy day. building. Yeah. Oh, mm. right. Yep. We'll but be like, what are you talking about, Leo? <laughs> oh, yes. Yes, but the following uh, Friday, May 1st, Paul and Mary Jo will be in studio. Please, we are sold out. Mary Jo mentioned that we were going to be in Petaluma last week, and I said, did you have a stroke? What are you talking about? <laughs> no, no, Paul. The stroke then, is all on you, my friend. Yes, that's what I found out. <laughs> Why do I taste copper? <laughs> um, we're going to oh. have lots of beer. The studio will be full of people. Um, Great. So don't just show up, kids, because we won't be able to let you in. We, we really are at the limit, uh, fire marshal limit for the studio. I know you guys talk about beer a lot, right? You, Mary Jo, right, you guys? Yeah. It's like a craft beer <laughs> thing yeah. going on. Yeah. And Leo, you're, I know you're a bourbon guy. Yeah, well, I got a whole, I'll tell you what, I'll share the Lagavulin with you if you want, or the. Hey, there the you bullet. go. I got now a little bur bullet right behind me. I got some good stuff. Mm -hmm. And wow. then let them drink the beer. <laughs> well, you know, you, I, I'll tell you what you should do. You should get Richard Campbell on the show to give you a lesson uh, in scotch. Oh. Because you <laughs> could go on for hours and you'd be loving it. <laughs> Every little detail you need to know it's about all the it? ways different kinds of scotch are made. Beers like made that too. It I sounds think. like our show is actually starting to come together as we speak. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be a lovely, lovely show. And what time are we starting? Yeah. Do you know? Is it 2 p.m.? Pacific? I thought it was yeah, 2. 2 p.m. 2 p.m. Pacific, 5 p.m. Eastern Time, 2100 UTC. You can watch live. In, in a couple of weeks or whenever it is, because I know it's not next week. It is next week, next Friday, it a is. week from Friday. It's a week from this Friday. Uh, Friday. What has happened? And I'll show you all my Apple Watch. It'll be fun. Oh, great. Yeah. Good. Come, come up, Carl. It'll be fun. <laughs> you, better you better not. You better not. All right. Should I bring a guitar? That's the question. Oh, please. Yes. Oh, you think? yeah. Bring whatever. You know, yes. people should bring their instruments. All right. And their guitars. <laughs> yes, always. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> bring your device. If you have a and device, too. if you've yeah. got a, a black bag full of instruments, whatever it is you have, bring the Pappy Van Winkle and we'll be here. Mm -hmm. I actually have some of that. There was a, 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 I swear to God, it's the hardest bourbon to find in the world, right? And a friend of mine who's a distributor called me and said, I've got four bottles of Pappy Van Winkle, a 23, a 15, and two 10s. I bought them all. Mm. I yeah. would have two, and I'm not even I, a brown liquor liker. My wife was like, I don't even want to see that <sighs> receipt. I don't even want to see it. But let's just say Christmas was really good that year. And I still have the 23 that's not even touched. It's open. Those numbers are the barrel numbers, right? Years. 1923? Years oh. No, no, no. Number of years <laughs> aged. Okay. It's not like wine. Three okay. years old. All right. Yeah. Nice. So you saved the and old we can stuff. Talk about, we can talk about Orphan Barrel, too, which is mm. my new fascination. Mm. Well, I'm not going to bring out any of my bourbon. You got to beat. <laughs> oh, okay. You got to beat. But I'll, I'll have it here if you, if you, if you deign... To well, I'll try explain. to find something locally, and I'll bring. Oh, that. there's great stuff all around. Yeah, yeah that'll be yeah, a lot of fun. D definitely come up. We'll talk to you after, after, you know, separately about how to make that happen too. All right. Yeah, yeah. Sounds great. Mary so Jo, have you, has your power gone out? <laughs> it, you know what? what just happened? It got, it was so sunny here a minute ago, and it just um, got pitch dark out. <laughs> if you see. If you yeah. see the pills, a giant Pillsbury Doughboy outside your window, <laughs> yeah, yeah. run! Oh, what just happened? <laughs> oh I think it's going to pour. Oh, my yeah. God. Mr. Franklin, thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you, Carl. Everybody must okay. go because, you know, .NET rocks. I've heard that, yeah. And everybody must listen. <laughs> <laughs> we have a lot to talk about this year. There was a couple of years there we didn't quite know what to talk it's about. It's good you hung in Especially there for the 1,100 there. episodes. Yeah. Yeah. 
Wow. Yep. Yeah. Good job. Well, thanks. Thanks for having me thanks, on. Thanks, Carl. Yeah, thanks Appreciate for being it. on. Um, let's dissolve his camera. We'll see you in a couple of weeks or whenever and Bill we'll is. we'll see you next, <laughs> next week, Paul. <laughs> I'm melting. It's, I'm it's melting. sometime in the future. That's all I know. The ether. All right. Next I to, week. I have to turn on some lights. Hold on. Okay. All right. While Mary Jo turns on lights and Paul just hangs in there. Hey, Paul, uh, he has this I'm going to talk about the meaning of time. Meaning of time. Let me talk about cooking. Is that all right with you? With you? Yeah. Let's sure. talk about Blue Apron. Have we sent you a Blue Apron box? We ought to. No, I don't oh, think so. Oh, you would love this. So the, the name Blue Apron comes from the uh, famous Cordon Bleu cooking school in uh, Paris. The apprentices wear blue aprons. And I think it's just an apt name for blueapron.com. Although it really wasn't designed as a cooking school. It is designed for people who love food, who love to cook or want to cook, but just don't have the time to amass the ingredients and plan the meal. Blue Apron will uh, send you an incredible meals, ready to cook, not cooked. Everything's fresh, nothing frozen. All the ingredients come directly from local farms. They are fabulous. They're healthful, 500 to 700 calories a serving. So yummy, you'd never know. Cooking takes about half an hour. The shipping is free. The menus never repeat. And it's about $10 a meal, which is amazing. They have they have a Blue Apron for two and Blue Apron for families. So if it's, you know, I think Blue Apron for two is so romantic. If you're, you know, you can cook here and make an amazing, delicious meal. Uh, by the way, accommodating your dietary preferences and delivery scheduling preferences. You know, you don't want to come home to a Blue Apron box that's been sitting there for a week, but they won't do that for you. The refrigerated boxes do keep the food delicious and fresh, and you're going to make an amazing meal. I want you to go to blueapron.com slash twit to get your first two meals absolutely free. Let's see what's on the menu this week. Sirloin tip steaks with new potato, asparagus, and radish, radish hash. One of the nice things about these, you get um, a, a beautiful color, full-page recipe card with illustrations and instructions. There's uh, online tips and techniques so you can know exactly how to do the things they're talking about. It is a cooking school. You just won't know it. And once you've cooked it once, uh, you're, you're going to know how to do it, and we'll do it again, I promise. I've been cooking a lot of the stuff we got originally from Blue Apron. How about Laotian Larb Guy with sticky rice, peanuts, and mint? You may not know what Larb Guy is. It's actually one of the best-known uh, Laotian and uh, Northern Thai dishes in the world, but it's, it's incredible. Chicken, vegetables, sticky rice, which is like my favorite thing in the world. <sighs> I'm, making, I'm just getting hungry. Look at this. Duca spiced salmon, harissa glazed heirloom carrot salad, three pea and barley miso ramen, asparagus and ricotta sandwich. Great meals delivered to your door. So yummy. And uh, at a great price, less than $10 each. It's like eating in the world's greatest restaurant, and you made it. You will impress, I guarantee you, the honey in your life. Blue Apron. Dot com slash twit get your first two meals free we've converted a lot of the people uh, in the in the twit family to blue apron Denise Howell uses it all the time um, Jason Howell uses it all the time I guess if your name is Howell you have to do it I was gonna say <laughs> any other Howells <laughs> Thurston use it Howell all the time. Uh, I we've been cooking them um, it's funny when we get the blue Ap we get blue apron boxes sent to the studio pretty much every week and uh, we kind of have a little auction we bid, we bring it to the kitchen say all right who wants to make the uh, the harissa glazed heirloom carrot salad this week with uh, date, molasses, and spinach almond couscous? You have never had anything so delicious. And once you've made it. Leo, I just ate at Applebee's. I don't know what you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sure, whatever you say. You can, by the way, uh, I probably shouldn't tell you this, but all these recipes are also online. So, and, and look what they send you heirloom carrots, not just regular, not grocery store carrots, heirloom carrots. Oh, man, I want to make this. So, Mary Jo, you could actually go online and get the ingredients and make this yourself without having a Blue Apron subscription. But let me let me know if you want me to get you the no, Mary Jo could. She's an accomplished chef. Well, exactly. <laughs> but anybody could with this stuff. All right. Well, it was fun having uh, whoever that guy I was. I know. I'm glad he could Carl. come on. That guy. That guy, Carl. That, that Richard guy. Campbell guy. Yeah. Franklin guy. Franklin, Ben Franklin. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, that was yep. really cool. I like, And I'm going to get some of that music because it sounds kind of neat. Yeah, nice. 
And we'll see more of him, I guess, uh, on Friday. Uh, how many other people are th are the Louder Mac twins going to come? <laughs> <laughs> I, I heard actually that we yet. don't know. So our, our plan was when we got to build, we'll, we'll see who's going to be around right. on Friday and try to figure that out. Let, just text us because um, we'll, we we <laughs> need to have a big enough table. <laughs> Yeah. And we'll put right. a microphone. Yeah, for okay. Yeah, we will, yeah, yeah, we definitely will do that. But yep. 2 p.m. It's going to be fun. 2 p.m. Pacific, 5 p.m. Eastern, 2100 UTC, May 1st, May day. You know, some people are obviously going to leave on Friday. Yeah, no, I understand. Yeah. So we'll, we'll, we yeah, we gotta, we're gonna, we'll figure that out. You know, the day after, if you guys want to stick around, we're going to do uh, the first edition of the new Screensaver show, which we're launching on oh, May 2nd. Oh, you guys brought that back. We're very That's excited cool. about that. Yeah. Would, lo awesome. would love you to be part of that. Morning. You got to go back? All right. No problem. Well, I'm going <laughs> back for one day and then I go to Chicago. I know. I'm going to Chicago the next day. What's Chicago? <laughs> Ignite. Or Ignite, the other Microsoft show. <laughs> I know. I know. <laughs> okay. Yep. Okay. It's, it's good stuff. Sorry. Whatever. <laughs> Whatevs. Um, is there a new build of Windows 10 Mobile? I think there was. Did I Im imagine that? No, uh, basically. <laughs> are you, are you just tired of the whole topic? <laughs> I'm actually kind of getting there. Um, this the build. build doesn't have any new features. It's just bug fixes. I mean, honestly, given the state of the OS, that's probably welcome at this point. Um, Microsoft talked recently about the universal apps uh, for Office, and so presumably this will be the build. You know, we'll be able to get those on. Um, but I didn't see it. I installed it on two phones. I haven't seen any new features, so I, I assume that that claim is true. <laughs> <laughs> Although it is working now on some of the phones that were bricked, get being oh. bricked, right? How do I unbrick? Uh, good question. Well, well the way I you unbrick to... is to use that recovery tool, which has and, been fixed. And, to... and, and with the recovery tool, put the newest edition on. Well, actually, with the recovery tool, you go back to eight one, and then oh, you'll you go have back. To oh, okay. it again. All right. Yeah. yeah, they have to change the recovery tool, right? They they have to issue a new version. Yeah, of it, it I was believe. it was blowing data down to the phone too quick, and so I guess on low end devices with not much RAM. Oh, uh, it so was 520, actually overwhelming. Five twenty five. Yeah. Oh, Those. interesting. Interesting. Yep. That makes sense. So, so just, not not the problem you have with the fifteen twenty. No, uh, it's a fast yeah. phone. So I don't know. Why, yeah, yeah, but. I, yeah. I, I think that was just a, that was just a bad phone and just something, <laughs> something that died on that. What's the deal with cyanogen? What is the what deal? Is <laughs> so, so is so Microsoft. So to go back a little in time, uh, cyanogen, yeah. which was started as a an alternative ROM for Android phones, you'd have to root the phone, put it a new recovery on, and then you could install cyanogen mod. Um, they kind of got some legitimacy when they started coming out on the OnePlus One phone. In fact, uh, mm -hmm. it, it made the OnePlus One a, a great phone. I was a big fan of it. Uh, then the CEO said, we are going to crush Android, which is a little strange, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, not just biting the hand that feeds you. It's biting the rest of the body. Swallowing the whole thing. Yeah. Uh, then there was a rumor Microsoft was going to, uh, false rumors it turned out, that Microsoft was going to pump some uh, big bucks into Cyanogen as an investor. That did not happen, right? No. Right. But apparently they are in bed a little bit. Yeah, so, yeah Microsoft and Cyanogen signed a partnership where um, Cyanogen is going to include and distribute some of Microsoft's consumer apps and services on their coming Android Similar to the Galaxy S6 where I'm getting... Uh, Skype and OneDrive yep. and OneNote, that kind of thing? Yep. More, more that than that. More than that. Yeah. Yeah, it's, um, let's see, I'm looking for the list here. Uh, it's Skype, OneNote, Outlook, the Bing services, um, Office, and OneDrive. Ooh, that's quite, that's pretty much it. That's the whole And it sounds though, as though um, on different devices, you may see different versions of those services are not all of those services on every device. It'll be surfaced where it's appropriate. Um, but still, they signed this partnership and Microsoft's building custom versions of these apps for Cyanogen. Interesting. From the point of yeah. view of Cyanogen, the, if you were going to kill Android, uh, you yep. need to get away from the Google apps and the Google services right. and you need a replacement. Right. Yep. Um, I don't know if this heralds a move away from Google apps to Microsoft apps, but it could. Uh, but you'd have to have a store. That would be the key. just another part of their mobile store. You know, it, yeah. it's 
they're, they're, they'll probably announce this year more deals with device makers uh, that make, you okay. know, Google Play right. devices, too. I mean, I'm, yeah. I think this is just kind of covering the bases. It, it, Microsoft would have to do some serious effort to replace the Google services. There's a lot of behind-the-scenes stuff. There's yeah. maps. There's a, yep. a, an app store. Um, I, I know. I yeah, think, the app stores, like, what are they going to do with that, right? right. It, and and that's by the, the way, and that's why the European Union is, is going after Google in that regard, is if you want Google Apps, you have to take the, if you want the App Store, which you need, yeah. you have to take yeah. the whole kit and caboodle. Well, what, is, uh, what does Cyanogen do now uh, for the, an App Store? They use Google Apps. Yeah. Okay. So when you install Cyanogen, you also install the Google uh, Apps. Uh, oh, so problem solved. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I, unless but, I see. Uh, problem solved, unless you say, I hate Google and I'm going to kill Android. Well, you could have yeah. sold the Amazon App Store. Um, oh, that's worse. Yeah. But that's no, how Amazon handled it, right? Amazon's AOSP. Right. It's pure. It's yeah. not a Google. It's a pure open source uh, yeah. implementation. So that's how they handled it. Presumably, if Cyanogen got enough cooperation from Microsoft, they'd need a lot. You'd have yeah. to write a lot of core services. Uh, they mm -hmm. could turn their back on Google. And that would be a very interesting play. It would. There's yeah. no uh, there's no evidence that that's the case, though. I mean, they're yeah, definitely teaming up to take on Google, right? Like, that's the message here. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah just like uh, Microsoft and Yahoo teamed up to take on Google. Wow. <laughs> 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 Not just like Sure. <laughs> wow. Did we, did we, did we uh, was I here last week? Yeah, we, did we talk about that, by the way? The uh, Yahoo deal. Yahoo deal. Um, I think we have some new. It's coming up. Uh, oh, coming, coming up. up. Yeah. Coming up. Coming up. Before that, though, let's talk about Office. Yeah. I feel like we've talked a lot already on the show today about Universal apps. Um, like yep, what's next for Office Universal. So I think we could skip that Are we item. still on track to, for instance, here's why I'm interested. Once mm -hmm. we get the new website up and the new API up for apps, I would like to find a XAML, I think, a XAML developer that could do one app that would run on, to me, I would love an, one app that would run on Windows 10, Windows Mobile 10, and Xbox. That's still on track, right? I'm not, yep. I'm not smoking. Yeah. No. The, the, that's, that's what that's next right. week is all about, or whenever yep. it is the right. build is happening. Great. Right. <laughs> right. You'll be whenever. there. It's next Wednesday, my yeah. friend. Yeah. Mary Jo's going to spend a lot of time just pointing me in the right direction. Like, Paul? You're in, you're Paul? In no, no, it's over here. Turn around, turn around. <laughs> I'll just, I'll dangle a pen loop and you'll follow along. <laughs> yeah, just drag me around. There is I'll a, have a pen loop on a necklace. There is one step, uh, you know, one of the things you get with the Google apps on Android is mail. Um, Outlook now is, right? Microsoft has Outlook or is it coming? Yeah. They have it on uh, iOS. As of today, in fact. Is this a complete or is this something different? Uh, it's a Complease code base that Microsoft's been tweaking, and it's Outlook for Android. It's in the Google Play Store today, wow. and it's no longer a preview Let version. It. It's the fine. Let me get it. Downloading now. Go get it. Go get it's it. It's there. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's so a solid good. app. Yep. Yeah. Is it like Outlook for the desktop? Because if it is, I'm not getting it. It's like Outlook no. for iOS. Uh, no, a Complete was yeah. great. I liked a Complete. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, that's what it's it, like. It's that. a Complete, yeah. although it's been updated yeah. significantly since the purchase. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, but the basic UI is the same. Looks like it is. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, they're, they're all they're starting, starting to, to kind look of Outlook I see. Yeah. 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 They, I mean, they're all they all have the customizations a bit for the underlying operating system, but if you put right now the coming version of Outlook for Windows Phone that app next to Outlook for Android and Outlook for iOS, they're starting to look more alike, which and, is what Microsoft wants. <laughs> and moving in the, the direction of more the of Android, as, the hamburger yeah. as opposed to the... Yep. Huh. Yeah, I mean, these are the, the pictures you're showing now are on the tablet, so it's not as kind of clear, but if you... I don't know if they have a phone version. They do have the accompli swiping thing, which I really like. Yep. Yeah. yeah, swipe gestures, which are customizable, which is kind of nice. Calendars in there. This looks good. I'm downloading this right now. Yep. That looks it. great. It's free. Another good thing. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's weird that they're showing the uh, the tablet. Yeah, it's just, tablet. I don't know why it's just tablet, yeah. Yeah. It says right on the top, though, for, for phones and tablets, phones I believe. And tablets. So. Yeah. It's yeah, compatible it's with it all is. my devices. And boy, I have a lot of Android devices. So, um, good. Coolio. What else? What else is going on in your lives? 
your, your <laughs> Microsoft lives. I, I mean, we can kind of maybe move along to the SharePoint Exchange stuff. Uh, they updated uh, OneNote on the web. Um, actually, in one case, it was literally OneNote on the web, got, I think, spell checking. And they added uh, something to Bing image shirts where you can save an image right to OneNote, which is kind of a nice integration feature. And they updated uh, Sway. But, you know, the, these kind of things get updated fairly often. I mean, just kind of going through the minutia of them isn't super interesting. But if you're using either of those things, you know, they've been updated. I think the bigger news here is the SharePoint Exchange stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So um, at Ignite, which is the week after Build, Paul, in Chicago. <laughs> Paul. So a month. So like a month from now. <laughs> Yeah, months from now. <laughs> yeah, not a month away. Yeah. It's about two weeks yep. away. Uh, Microsoft's sure. going to be talking about the next versions of SharePoint Server, which they call SharePoint Server 2016, and Exchange Server, which they call Exchange Server 2016. Now, the thing you need to know is Exchange Server 2016 ships in 2015. It's going to ship before the end of this year. But Exchange, uh, but SharePoint Server 2016 was also, which was also supposed to ship this year, is now shipping. Q2 2016. Uh, and Microsoft announced last week they are pushing back the date for SharePoint Server 2016, though they didn't really say why um, they're pushing right. it back. They just said, you know what, we're not going to have it out this year, and, but we're still going to show you and show you it at um, Ignite. And we're going to talk about it and we're going to share more about the feature set and kind of what the goals are in terms of improvements around mobile and cloud and compliance and reporting. But Right now, we are not going to even get you the test build of that until December or so of this year. So, yeah, SharePoint's running later than we thought. Exchange Server 2016. Um, I think some people already have this now in private private preview, but um, it's basically Microsoft is going to be updating document collaboration and some of the search capabilities around um, Exchange Server as well as uh, the basic APIs around calendar and mail and contact. So it's just going to be getting some of these incremental updates to bring it more up to feature parity with Exchange Online. Uh, so but both of those things are going to be very big at Ignite. So in a couple weeks, we'll hear more on that. And then um, we should mention the customer lockbox too, I think. Um, okay. At at RSA yesterday, Microsoft talked about this new feature they're adding to Office 365 and to Exchange Online by the end of this year, that it's it's basically like a notification feature is my understanding. So if you're somebody who for some reason has a problem with Exchange where Microsoft actually needs to go into your account and look at customer data to fix it, they can't just do it um, and they won't just do it. This is going to be, they have to give you written or emailed notice or however they give you the notice um, so that you have the right to refuse or not um, allowing Microsoft access to, to your account. Um, <laughs> I you mean that you didn't have that before? I know. I was surprised too. I'm like, wait, you, what? did they just do that before? <laughs> they just wandered well, in? I, so we, we'll take care of it. I don't, no, it's no. I, another, I think thing, people right? were calling for support and then realized in the yeah. course of support that someone who works for Microsoft is now looking at my customer data exactly. or my internal data. Yeah. Yeah. One would so, think there would be a moment during that call in which they'd say, I'd like to access your customer data. By the way. <laughs> By the way. Sure. Yeah. But this gives you an extra level of protection now and your administrator will hear from Microsoft and say, hey, if we, if you want us to fix this, we have to look yeah. at your customer data. This Do you is, want us to? Yes or no. This is appropriate. <laughs> and this is responding to the overall concern about privacy yeah. going on right now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that's, that was a good good news thing yep so that's it for office that's all our all right let's talk there. bing then <laughs> finally <laughs> finally i've been waiting finally <laughs> finally so what so they we last uh, when last we visited the microsoft bing alliance uh we <laughs> yeah they the were shakiest of the we, uh, yahoo had said we're going to extend the talks for 30 days and we speculated a lot on what's going on. Are they not making enough money from the deal? You know, Microsoft gives uh, Yahoo Search, but uh, uses Yahoo's sell, you know, o o Overture uh, ads, and blah. I don't know. It's complicated. Sure, it and is complicated. It's, it's a actually. revenue, you know, some sort of revenue sharing. And uh, so, what what do they end up doing? Um, so. We knew already that they had renegotiated the deal and that there had been some changes made as to um, how much 
of um, Yahoo's backend search is now going to be powered by Bing. On the desktop, it had been 100%. Um, and on mobile, I guess it had not. But uh, now it's, I think, 51% is going to be powered by Bing. And you, Yahoo has an open kind of a option to get somebody else to power the other 49% if they think it makes more sense. Now, who who is the other person? It's Google, right? I mean, who else is going to do that? <laughs> um, right. But yeah, uh, so we don't know how that's going to work or if, if anything around antitrust would prevent that from happening. We don't really know what it means that they are untethered from the Microsoft agreement in that way now. But what came to light this week that's kind of interesting that we didn't know last week was um, I had been asking around, you know, okay, now that they renegotiated the deal, can either of them get out of the deal before five more years? Because this was the five-year point in the 10-year deal. Um, and it turns out, yes, they can. Either of them can get out of the deal after this October. And all they have to do to get out of it is send a written notice to the other and say, hey, we're done and give them four months heads up and then the deal is done. By the way, to put that in perspective, for me to leave my yeah. gym, I had to show up physically. So <laughs> these guys could just send a letter and they're out. Right, right. You know? so, oh, they got that going for them. So it's well, it I mean, that's actually like very interesting. I mean, that, that's it is. in many ways it's the most notable part of this deal. I know it is in a way. Although, again, you have to ask yourself if you're Yahoo and you say, "Hey, we don't want Bing to power this anymore." What is going to yeah, do the it, back end powering of your search? We well, you don't have search. That's all. Uh, yeah. Or, I mean, or either you get Google or you have been secretly building your own search capabilities in the background, which we think is what's been happening. Um, they've been continuing to build their own search um, engines in some way, at, at least for mobile and maybe in other areas. You or they have some this, other... You know, I don't think you could do it too much in secret because one of no, the things you'd need it. to do to make a search engine is crawl the web. Exactly. And <laughs> web crawlers are not invisible. You They're see them. They're not secret. <laughs> In fact, right. I could look at my log and I would see what web crawlers yep. have visited. Right. Unless right. they're so doing I, it under, you know, Baidu or something. Yeah. No, I think I think they were continuing. They had the right to hold on to a number of their own internally developed search technologies, even when they did that agreement with Microsoft. Uh, so now the question is, you know, do you kind of step up that work? Um, do you just do mobile and not desktop? Or they have a lot of options. But the question is, how many of these really make sense? Yeah. Because running a web, a web search engine, it's kind of like running a cloud data center, right? It's not for everybody and it's not for people <laughs> who don't have deep pockets, right? Yep. <laughs> so, well, um, and I really wonder yeah. if, if, this, if Yahoo is a content company, do they even need search? I, by the way, that's a fantastic question. Or is it enough to just be able to build on top of someone else's basically commoditized back end? Right. Which is sort right. of what they're doing right now. I, I, I'm actually reading a book about Yahoo now, and I'm, I'm desperate to find the answer to the question, what the hell is Yahoo? But basically, <laughs> I, I, this was the fundamental question facing the company when Microsoft tried to buy them, when they, you know... I. Do they need this? I don't know. You know, people have gone back and forth over this. I mean, I think it was Carl for, Bartz who decided, let's just get this deal done with Microsoft yeah. and get it done, you know. For historic um, reasons, we think of Yahoo as a search engine, but, but that's historic. Yeah. And, and, of course, when Marissa Meyer became CEO, the question was, is she going to make them a, co a content-only company or is it going to be a services yep. company like Google <laughs> is? Um, and it's or just a, a portal company like Yahoo or, I mean, I, I don't, I mean, sorry, like AOL. Um, I, I don't. A don't know what they are. I don't think that they know. No, this is part of the fundamental problem. Well, with this, I but, feel like. I mean, uh, I, no one looks at them as a technology company. There's no platform that Yahoo has that no. people are building off of. I you feel know? like Meyer um, must know so, what her strategy, what her goals are at this by this time. How long has she been CEO? Uh, a couple of years. Yeah. yeah, two years. I would hope so. Yeah. And it sure looks like they're a content company, let's face it. Mm -hmm. Not a search company. Yeah. Yeah. Now, ad sales yeah, is I, critical, I, but you put uh, ad sales Netflix on your... is uh, Netflix is not building an internet they don't need uh, one. services company. They, they don't just they, they fly in the back of that stuff. I mean, that's right. what Yahoo should be doing. Yeah. Interesting. That may be what the source of this conversation with Microsoft is all about. We don't now. know. You know, remember, part of this deal is that if... if um, 
if Microsoft doesn't deliver a, uh, certain results, you know, they, they pay Yahoo Extra. Like, there's right. a minimum guarantees on payments. Um, and we don't know what those have looked like over time, I don't think. I, I, according to the book I'm reading now, the first, at least the first three years of this deal, Microsoft had to pay them extra because they weren't delivering yep. enough. Uh, I, this is completely unsourced, so I can't speak to the veracity of that. But um, I think part of the problem from Meyer's perspective was that they weren't getting enough. I think another part of the problem was they weren't able to control their own destiny enough and do more of the advertising on top of yep. Uh, the search results. And so I think she probably accomplished both. You know, Kara Swisher is the only one who really knows what's going on. Uh, I know. Inside. I, I say that so much. More, more than <laughs> Marissa Meyer knows about what's going on. Although at some no, point, Kara's got to wonder, gosh, is this really what I want to, my legacy to be? Um, I was the person who knew oh, what was going on inside Yahoo. Yeah. Like, really? <laughs> I was the person who knew what was going on inside AOL. Does she know what Yahoo is? I could, I, I would appreciate that answer. Well, uh, AMA AWL in our chat room pointed us to an article from January of last year by Kara Swisher mm -hmm. on Recode, talking about search technologies called Fast Break and Curveball that Yahoo was working on. Um, so uh, I don't, you know, I don't. The, Yahoo's like Google is an advertising company. Um, right. Unlike Google, they sell their advertising against their content. Uh, they currently sell advertising well, against, Bing against other people's content. Anybody, I'd high five you if I was right. There. <laughs> 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 so um, I don't know. It's really you know. There's a lot of conversation right now about this because yeah. Once you've been CEO for three years, you know you pretty pretty much need to. Yeah. Uh, Actually, if you if you're a Yahoo, you pretty bait. much need to move on. That's yeah. usually the time yeah. to get rid of them. Time to fish or cut bait. Yep. All right. Uh, Why well, we've exhausted that topic. Microsoft closes its open source subsidiary. Yeah, this is just a very quick mention. So um, Microsoft had this subsidiary they called Microsoft Open Technologies. It was a wholly owned subsidiary that they started three years ago. And last week they quietly announced, well, it's funny. What they quietly announced was that they were folding it back into the company. Uh, but what they're really doing is shuttering it. And they're not laying off the people who work there. They're giving them a chance to find other jobs inside the company, I believe. Um, but yeah, it, the, the reason they're shuttering it is kind of interesting. When they started this it, just three years ago, open source was still not really widely accepted by Microsoft management. And they were kind of like one of the bastions of open source at Microsoft. But now every division at the company is doing open source. They're open sourcing code. They're working with GitHub. They're working with, you know, Docker, they're working with all kinds of companies that they didn't work with in the past. So you don't really need a wholly owned subsidiary that's separate now. Well, in fact, um, as you point out in your article, Microsoft doesn't say we're closing it. They say we're absorbing it. Yeah, <laughs> absorbing it. Yeah. They're closing it, guys. <laughs> anyway. It's like, it's like embracing it, extending it. <laughs> it kind of is, yeah. <laughs> we're absorbing but, uh, but it. It's it's good news that they don't need it uh, to me. Like there is a good news piece here it, and it's now Microsoft is embracing open source and, and in fact, almost mandating open source inside the company. Um, so you don't really need somebody who's the champion that's outside the company. Right, yeah. Right. Uh, new creative cloud version of uh, Lightroom came out yesterday. Lightroom six. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm excited. I downloaded it immediately. And I think Microsoft folks might be thrilled because there is a Surface Pro 3 mode. Yeah, I don't quite get how this is possibly only for Surface Pro 3. But apparently, uh, if you're using it with a keyboard, Lightroom works as it does anywhere else. It looks like Lightroom has all the same toolboxes, etc. Um, but if you remove the keyboard, which I take it to mean a type cover, but also perhaps a, you know, a keyboard on a dock system or whatever, uh, and you're using it as a tablet, it switches into a tablet-specific wow. mode where it's touch-friendly controls and I like you know, browsing and light editing and so forth. Yeah, That's awesome. I think Interesting. That, that that pushes me to buy a Surface Pro 3. I think there would be a lot of photographers who up well, to yeah, now have so purchased I, I, Macs, I've only but... used Photoshop like this, but Photoshop, Lightroom, and Illustrator all have... Well, they're not actually like specific Surface Pro 3 because they work on other high DPI displays too, but they have Surface Pro 3 specific features, which also work on some other Windows computers where they adapt to the device in some ways. You know, for Photoshop, it's about the high DPI 
uh, screen, so it, it bumps up all the UI elements so you can actually see them. Uh, too much, in my opinion, but whatever. It's, it, it, it works. It's there. Uh, but now I, I think the Lightroom one is the most aggressive of those. It's pretty cool. Adobe makes a Lightroom for an iPad, but it's not nearly, uh, you know, it's not the full Lightroom functionality. It, it syncs up right. via collections over the cloud. Um, it, and, but, but I think for a lot of people, the idea of a touch tablet to go th to do the triage. So I come home mm -hmm. with 3000 pictures from my trip, uh, yeah, or, the or the wedding, uh, you know, shoot. And I flick through them. I say this, 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 this very quick and touch touch is a very natural way to do it. You can zoom in. It's a great screen on the surface pro three. So you're getting a very accurate reproduction of the photo. Um, I'm not sure how you're getting the photos in there. Uh, cause you don't have a huge amount of storage, but I don't know about that. I'll have to try it. It tempts me, I gotta say. Um, and then I could do some simple adjustments with the, with the pen. Wow. Mm -hmm. I really like that. So that it does use the pen. Well, yep. you haven't tried it yet. I don't know. Have no, you? but it's, no. yeah, of course it does. I mean, yeah, yeah. it's and touch or pen. That yeah. bundle is a great deal. The photography bundle is a Photoshop and Lightroom for 10 bucks a month is a very good deal. I'm, I'm, in, I'm, boy. Yeah. Interesting. I'm a big Lightroom guy, as you could tell. <laughs> it's all about the Lightroom. It. Oh, I love it. <laughs> I love it. Well, you're probably a Photoshop guy, though, right? Yeah, I use Photoshop yeah. all the time. Yeah, because you're a designer more than a photographer. I don't know. I shouldn't put I'm words I'm an actor mouth. and an entrepreneur. <laughs> <laughs> he plays He's guitar. Donald Trump, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. And you're yep. fired. Microsoft <laughs> is making, has announced it's going to make an Apple Watch a version <laughs> of a PowerPoint so I can advance sure. my PowerPoint slides by tapping my watch. Hallelujah. That's basically, that's almost exactly what they announced. Yep. <laughs> so, yep. yeah. Why it's not? about time. The actually, thing is, uh, Apple responded immediately by on. saying, we're doing that for Keynote, too. Which is of funny. Course. Yeah. Sure. Of course. Uh, that's, yeah, that's so it. no surprise here. Yeah. A lot of people buy, if you do if you do a lot of slide talks and stuff, buy clickers or something so they can advance yep. it. Yeah. Uh, there are okay. phone apps. You know, we talked about that yeah. recently, uh, Office Remote. That's right. That's right. Yeah. So uh, Office Remote on the Apple Watch. All five of you can enjoy Basically. That. And uh, uh, the crossover between people who actually own an Apple Watch and would be doing a PowerPoint presentation is <laughs> perhaps small. I don't know. Yeah. On their okay. iPhone. I don't know. I've heard that Beyonce does a lot of PowerPoint. <laughs> I might be yeah, wrong. Could that be. new gold watch. I must day. have misheard. Here's what I'm thinking for the next album. <laughs> Slide one of 47. <laughs> I've prepared a little presentation for you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, I am actually, I downloaded the uh, Outlook for my uh, Nexus 7. You know, the, mm -hmm. there might be a reason on the uh, Android, but there might be a reason why they show the tablet thing. It really is very tablet-centric. It's perfect on a tablet. It works uh, great on a phone. I have it on my Mac, okay. Uh, okay. Galaxy S5, too. Yeah. Microsoft's doing a good job both on iOS and now on Android of, of these mobile apps. I think they're quite good. Yeah. And the acquisitions yep. have been strategic and smart. Um, what do you think? Uh, do, you have a, do you have the Android version of Outlook, you said? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I last week I looked at what was available from Microsoft and iOS, and not surprisingly, it's like you know fifty something or whatever apps. It's kind of Huge. amazing. Yeah, um, it's actually pretty close on Android as well. There are many, many apps, uh, Microsoft apps on Android. The thing that's interesting about Android, and this probably plays into that Cyanogen story from before, is that Android uh, being more open is also more extensible by third parties. And so some of the things that Microsoft can do on Android, it can't do on iOS. And so we, we see things like lock screen replacements. Um, and I use the next lock screen uh, that Microsoft makes. It's fantastic. It's got different modes for when you're at work, when you're at home or if you're on the road. You can launch apps from it. You can check your calendar. You can do text messaging. There's all this stuff that is built right into the, the lock screen. Um, but, you know, it's one of those things like as a Windows phone user, I, I sort of didn't really ever want to look this closely. <laughs> you know, like I have... I mean, I have test phones and they have Microsoft apps on them. And I, you know, I don't really, I don't use, sit here and use Android and um, iOS every, well, actually I do use iOS every day, but I don't, I don't use them as my primary device. And, uh, and I have a bunch of Microsoft apps on here, but, you know, we've talked in the past about the Microsoft account app, which is that really nice way of doing uh, two-factor authentication uh, where you don't have to type in codes, you know, you just accept it on the phone. Uh, that's an Android only app at this point. Um, 
it's just it's kind of amazing. The one the one bit piece that's missing on phones is the new Office apps. It, right now, they still only have the Office Hub uh, single app, like we have on Windows Phone. But soon we'll have, you know, full blown uh, Word, Excel, and PowerPoint. In, in addition to uh, OneNote and OneDrive, which already I'm sorry, OneNote and um, Outlook, which already exist. But you know, I, I mean, honestly, for being in the Microsoft ecosystem. Um, it's not quite parity. There's a few things on iOS that are unique to iOS. There are a few things to Android that are unique on Android. Um, I want to say there were a few things on <laughs> Windows Phone that are unique to Windows Phone, but there aren't that many, unfortunately, anymore. Um, you really can get like a full-blown Microsoft experience on any mobile device right now. It's, it's a pretty amazing change from even just like a year ago. It is. Every single it? device on this table just buzzed me. Mm, must be time. Time Something for your meds, Paul. <laughs> yep. <laughs> time to book it your says, tickets. You gotta, you gotta go to. You're traveling next you week, traveling. buddy. What are, what are you doing? We <laughs> should all go to Sydney to welcome the new Microsoft store in Sydney. I oh, I, I totally want to do that. Sydney is a great city. Yeah. Do you First, know where in Microsoft. Sydney? Yes, we know Westfield, Sydney, on Pitt Street Mall. Cool. Next uh, to the First, Sephora, right there. <laughs> Yeah, nice. and near an Apple store, I believe, yeah. as well. Yeah. Um, sure. First Microsoft brick-and-mortar store outside of North America. Oh, I didn't so, realize that. Wow. Yep. And now there's rumor, I saw on, on Neowin today, Brazil might have the second um, somewhere. Don't they have a big piracy problem in Brazil? Am I wrong? I thought Brazil was like a big Linux country. <laughs> I, I think they are a big Linux I country, think they are. actually. They um, big, but I, the big I think open they also... Community. Big Windows Phone, ah. I believe. I mean, um, well, big, bigger than 3%, but <laughs> maybe not that big. <laughs> ah, Biggish. Relatively big. Big -ish. Yeah. Good. All right. Uh, let's see. We'll clean up some of the details and go to the back of the book. Let's see. We've got an um, uh, update for Xbox. Yeah, I haven't fully written. I wrote the May system update. So the, the May system update we're going to get on Xbox One is now in preview testing. So if you're in the Xbox One preview program, you get that. Um, the big one, in my mind, is uh, finally support from Miracast, meaning that if you're using your Xbox One to kind of do everything oh, on nice. your HDTV, oh, that's nice. you can now wireless,ly display a, a Windows phone, a Windows device, an Android phone or tablet. Uh, to the screen through this one device you already have. Or if you're going to look at it kind of from a more cynical standpoint, you can say, look, I just created a $500 version of a $29 dongle or whatever. But, you know, <laughs> you don't have to switch HDMI inputs. It's, it's, you know, it's a nice thing. It should no, be that's there, good. So. Miracast is important to support, I think. Yeah, and I don't know as much. I haven't looked at this one as much. Um, it's a little tougher now because I'm traveling. But Microsoft is talking up the Xbox app for Windows 10 and I believe has updated it and it will be available through the store. So if you're on the... Uh, the preview, you'll be able to get the new version of it. And I think that the big new thing in this release is game DVR for Windows games. Um, and that's oh, about all I can say. How about would it, that work? It, so. That's a good question, Leo. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> I'm not really would sure. Would you have to have the I app running? To... Yeah, so you would be able to... Uh, in other words, the point behind Game DVR is something awesome just happened in the game right. and you want to take a clip of it's it. It's awesome on an Xbox. You do it all the time. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's an Xbox so, verbal command. Right. My, As I recall, the way they explained this back in January was that this would, should work for any game. In fact, it could it should work it could work outside of games as well. Um, basically, where you say, oh, I want to record that, however you uh, make that happen. And then you can go back in time a certain amount of seconds and get a recording of some excellent thing that just happened in a game and post it to a social network or, um, or I should say to their, you know, they have a built-in uh, service that's part of Xbox Live and then from there you could save it to a social network. I guess network. if you could so, do it on an Xbox, uh, you could do it on a PC. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so before we get... I'll to, look at that soon. Yeah, would I'll you? Would soon. you please? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> would you? But you are going to get on an airplane soon. Uh, That's what I hear. Build is coming. When does build start? <laughs> build Monday? Two weeks from now, Leo. Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> next Wednesday, Next Paul. Wednesday. So uh, <laughs> a week from today. So that's why we won't be doing the show uh, Wednesday. We'll be doing it on Friday at 2 p.m. Pacific, 5 p.m. Eastern on May 1st. You're having a meetup on Thursday, right? We are. At Thursday night. If you're in San Francisco, Paul, be there, please. Yeah. 
five thirty <laughs> to eight thirty at a bar called the Irish Bank. You don't need to RSVP; just show up. You'll see us. We'll all be there. <laughs> You'll see us. The <laughs> Irish the Bank one, Bar. Right what a name for a place. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then we are sold out for tickets for our live uh, show on May first. Uh, I'm sorry to say, um, it was a very popular uh, item. But That's good, uh, though. we will stream it live. You can watch it live. And it sounds like we're going to have a lot of fun. And then there's going to be a beer it event. Yep. Uh, we're doing a beer podcast oh, um, at Ignite, the next Microsoft show, which uh, the beer podcast is on um, Sunday, May 3rd, and it'll be available later. I'm, I'm doing it with these Microsoft guys, Joey Snow and Rick Klaus, and they do a show on Channel 9 called Patch and Switch. So we're going to talk all about beer. Like oh, good. <laughs> and um, we had a contest. We talked about it on the show here last week. And if you won and you're going to get a free ticket to that, I'm going to be DMing you very soon on Twitter cool. and telling you. you <laughs> that sounds uh, very <laughs> violent. Yeah. <laughs> I'll be DMing you. I'm and then this is you. great. We Paul and I are going to have a Windows Weekly meetup in Chicago also. Oh, good. Um, yep. May 4th. Um, you don't need to RSVP. It's 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. at a place called Pork Chop on Randolph Street in Chicago. So just come. So I hope it's exactly what it sounds like. Pork it Chop? <laughs> <laughs> I saw there this place and I was chops. like, this looks like your kind of restaurant, Mary Jo. Pork it's, Chop. I know. Yeah, she's going to be happy. Par it's all barbecue, Southern, I mean, Chicago barbecue oh and craft God. beer and lots of whiskeys. Oh, my God. Should be a nice place. To All right, Joby, living on coleslaw and beer. They have catfish. I eat fish. Oh, catfish. <laughs> catfish is good. And cornbread. It'll be mm, good. That sounds real good. It sounds like the Russians are trying to break into my bunker. <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> tap, tap, tap. Well, we're almost done here. We are. So uh, let the Russians in. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, let's start with uh, Paul's tip of the week. So uh, last week... Although it seems like longer ago than that, I seem to, I have an ongoing problem with time. Apparently, um, I I wrote I wrote about and then talked about uh, kind of an examination of free alternatives to Microsoft Office. And then actually, since writing that, I've been using them more often. And uh, the two that I've used the most are Office Online and Google Docs. And in both cases, you can actually do a few things to make them work a little bit more like a you know a real downloaded. Uh, you know, kind of offline version of Office. And in the case of Office Online, obviously it looks and works like Microsoft Office, so there's not as much to do. Uh, but you can, of course, pin that to your taskbar and kind of access it uh, like a, an app of sorts, and it works pretty well like that. Um, Google Docs, it's, it, it pains me to admit this, is actually more sophisticated in the sense that you can um, configure it to work offline. Um, you can also, you don't have to do this on the on the Microsoft side, but you can also change the style sheets and so forth to make the documents create look exactly like, you know, you, documents you'd create in uh, the latest version of Microsoft Word. And so I've kind of written up how you can do all that stuff um, if you are so inclined and don't wish to pay for Office. And then uh, the software pick of the week is Halo Spartan Strike. And so this is the second... In I guess what is going to be a series of top-down Halo games. So it's not like a triple-A Halo first-person person title, uh, but it's a mobile game. And the first version, the first game um, was called Halo Spartan Assault. It probably came out about say over a year ago, a year and a half ago. Uh, and that game uh, came out for Windows Phone and Windows uh, Windows, you know, Win Windows Modern at the time. For the second game, they're releasing it on Windows 8 and Windows Phone 8, of course, but also on Steam, which is the, you know, kind of rival PC-based gaming service. And more painfully, on iPhone and iPad. And concurrent with those releases, they're releasing the first game on the other platforms as well. And so if you've never played them and you want to play it on an iPad, you can buy a pack that has both games uh, at a reduced price. And if you're familiar with the first Halo Spartan Assault, um, Spartan Strike is going to look uh, very similar. It has you know, new weapons, new ships, new environments, and, you know, new enemies and things like that. But it's it's basically the same type of game. It's just kind of more of it. Um, and the first game was fantastic. And so um, I actually did install this on my iPad, uh, which, and of course, by doing that, I've, I've now not actually played it that much because I don't actually use the iPad that much. But I wanted to see what it looked like. And depressingly, it looks exactly like it does on Windows. So um, <laughs> if you do have such a device, congratulations. Uh, you can play Halo now. 
I'm sorry. I'm just talking to. Uh, I'm just talking to. This is so weird. I'm talking to uh, somebody at our front door right now. <laughs> <Great>. <laughs> Well, <laughs> yeah, I, I can't let you in from here. I'm at work, but uh, Michael should have his key. That is just weird. That is weird. <laughs> <laughs> that is very strange. Uh, oh, okay. See you later. Love you. Bye bye. <laughs> <laughs> One more thing to bother you. <laughs> Although it's kind of good security wise, right? Isn't that wild? Let Leo, imagine door. you'll be doing that on your Apple Watch soon. Any minute now. <laughs> Mine's coming Friday, by the way. I, uh, Wow, well, that's actually very quick. I'm surprised. Did they uh, contact you to tell you that? Or did you Not yet. Look I'm looking. I, I refresh in the Apple Store regularly, and it says yeah. uh, preparing for ship. Um, okay. So I have a feeling that means. Now I haven't gotten the text. Usually I get a text by now, but uh, we'll see. Yeah. Um, hey, this just coming in from the Wall Street Journal. Uh, former HP CEO Carly Fiorina plans to announce her presidential bid. So, by the way, I'd like to talk about that because she is possibly the dumbest person I've ever seen in my entire life. And the notion of her running for president is laughably dumb. <laughs> well, it's interesting because her statement is the Republican slate, there's so few people running uh, for president mm -hmm. that I thought I'd just throw my... I just kinda, I could just like kind of slip in and no one would notice. Into the ring, yeah. <laughs> so she's that apparently... woman is an atrocity. Okay. And I, well, I guess you won't be is, endorsing her for president then. He will not. <laughs> That's Dumber it. than Sarah Palin? No. For, yeah, for, for good reason. He's, he's, she's he's, about in the same category, actually. <laughs> oh, pretty God. close. Pretty close. Wow. Yeah, no, she's not smart. Interesting. And you've had some personal experience with her, I, I take it. Yeah, yeah but I, I more recently I've seen her talking about politics, yeah. and it makes me want to yeah. scourge my eyeballs out. But anyway, sorry. Okay. Back to <laughs> Halo <laughs> Spartan Strike. Uh, something we can control. <laughs> Um, do you want to do the Enterprise Pick of the Week, Mary Jo Foley? I do. The Enterprise Pick of the Week is a new technology Microsoft announced this week called Azure Service Fabric. So if you know what Microsoft's been doing in the cloud with Azure, you know they've got IaaS, Infrastructure as, as a Service, and PaaS, Platform as a Service. And almost everything they've been doing lately is about hosting Linux and hosting Windows Server on Azure. That's the IaaS part. The PaaS part, they've been really quiet about. And this is what Azure Service Fabric is all about. It, I, I call it kind of for shorthand PaaS 2.0. That's what it is. And Microsoft at Build next week, Paul, again, it's next week. Uh, they're going sure? to be delivering a developer preview of Azure Service Fabric to people who are there. They're going to be having a number of sessions about it. They're going to be showing it off. Uh, it's, it's a layer in the cloud that is going to let you do uh, develop your applications in the form of microservices that can communicate through APIs. So it's related to what they're doing with containers and Docker. Um, it just is, is kind of them revamping how they're going about trying to get people to write cloud applications from scratch. So expect to hear a lot more about this next week at Build. Like it. Like it. Yep. And uh, our code name of the week. Codename of the week is one we've had before. It's Athens. And Athens, we had thought, was the codename for Windows for IoT. Windows 10, I should say, for IoT. And in fact, that's what it is. Athens is Windows 10 IoT for small devices. This is the, the version of Windows 10 that's going to be on Raspberry Pi and other small devices like that for the maker community. Uh, I believe, I'm just guessing this, by the way, no one's told me this. I would be very surprised if people who attend Build don't get hands-on time and maybe even a Raspberry Pi device with this Build that on it next so week. so cool. I think that's it's what they're going to It's 35 bucks. No. I mean, we're not talking a big expenditure here. That, well, if cool. I were Microsoft, I would give that Heck away. Heck yeah. Right? Yep. You want everyone to have that. Heck yeah. Yep. What a, that's so and exciting. Right, so far, you haven't had this SKU, this Windows 10 IoT SKU available to people in a public forum. If you want people to start developing for this, you get them the board, you give them the, the bits, and you say, hey, go wild. So I, I think we're going to hear about Athens next week also. So I know you know this, but you do know that Athens is an overloaded uh, term oh, and that Microsoft used, used it previously. It. Yes, I do. They've used it a couple times, right? Yeah, the one that I'm thinking of was uh, Internet Mail and News, which was the predecessor for Outlook Express. Yeah. It's codenamed Athens. Uh-huh. Back wow. in, I don't know, the late 90s maybe? Yeah, wow. Well, okay. I think they've yeah. used it a couple other ways as well. But this is the new Athens. 
We've also just learned that rapper Waka Flocka Flame is going to be running for president. <laughs> now, by the way, uh, that guy. <laughs> he's smart. I support that guy. Uh, yeah. Waka Flocka Flame. Good. Look at him. The more the merrier. I think I like the, cra the crazy eyes are a nice touch. Would it be President Flame or President Flocka Flame? <laughs> <laughs> or maybe he'd be informed it would be President Waka Flocka. <laughs> oh, that's good. Okay. <laughs> Finally, now you know why we all drink uh, a lot of beer. Mary Jo Foley with our beer pick of the week. That's okay, good. this might be my best beer pick of the week ever. Ever? Oh, ever. Please. Because please. Paul's going to turn his nose up because it's an IPA, but look at the label. Look okay, at the label at of the this label. beer, which is called Carbon for Brewing's Fantasy Factory. It is a cat riding a unicorn with a ray gun. Where have we seen this before? This little cat. Well, actually, where we saw it before was here, but where it was stolen <laughs> and used <laughs> elsewhere. Yes. Where is it from? So, what is it? What's the story? Th so uh, Microsoft's been uh, kind of circulating these stickers that have a ninja cat on a unicorn yeah. holding a yeah. flag that has the Windows flag on it. Oh. Uh, I would say it's this cat on this unicorn, pretty much. You'd say this is prior art. I might say that. Um, but what's cool is um, one of our listeners of Windows Weekly, Jay Hack, he said, hey, have you ever had this beer? And he shipped it to me from, Wis from Wisconsin, nice. where the brewery is. Not and he said, you, wait, you wait till you see the label. And yep, there it is. I even have the bottle. I'm just saving it. It's like, yeah. Ninja cat. Hold, <laughs> so you actually, hold it up This for is us actually so very good it. beer is what you're saying. It's, it's, she Paul, hasn't tasted I think it's an IPA. it. She just likes the label. I think it's an IPA you way, would I just like. Had, I just had Goose Island IPA. I know. And I loved you it. liked it. I loved ah. it. There we go. And Mary, oh, Mary knows Joseph. Right. We joke about IPAs. I actually like IPAs. It's just that most people screw them up. Okay. I think you, you would know, like this The problem one I have is like the, the kind of cheap craft beer effect you get with like yeah. really hoppy effects and so forth is just yeah. overdone. This is not that. If you can find this beer, it's more on the multi side, less less like a hop bomb, more a balanced, more maltier beer. It was very good. I this is an empty bottle. Yeah, a lot of those beers, it's like <laughs> chewing on rocks. You know. It isn't exactly, yeah. by the way, a copy of the Ninja Cat no. riding a it's unicorn. It's facing the other way. Yeah, one. and the, and I'm, yeah. I'm going to pull. Well, no, it I, I think the point is this beer came first. It, the, it's the Ninja go. Cat unicorn thing that is ripping off the design. Uh, and there is no <laughs> rainbow in the Microsoft version. <laughs> No, uh, right. The <laughs> right. It's completely flag. different. Yes. I, the I, 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 yeah, actually, now that you mention it, I, it's I, completely yeah. different. It is completely it's different. Completely different. That's but so it's well, one cool. thing. That's a boy cat. The other one's a girl cat. As you can right. clearly see. <laughs> <laughs> so we don't know if it's good uh, beer, but we love the label from Fantasy Factory. No, the beer Factory. is good. Oh, oh good. The All right. Good. Fantasy I'm Factory sorry. from uh, Carbon Four Brewing in Wisconsin. In Wisconsin. Yeah. Paul Therat is at therat.com. That's where he hangs his hat these days and his fine Therat mug. And I'll be seeing you next week in Dedham, Massachusetts, because I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> he is resisting the notion <laughs> that somehow he's got to get on an airplane next week. And uh, Wednesday is billed. Don't forget their special event on Thursday at the Irish Bank Bar. Uh, and, uh, of course, Friday, May 1st, we'll be doing a live Windows Weekly, 2 p.m. It's not going to be this up. next Wednesday. It's next Friday, 2 p.m. Pacific, 5 p.m. Eastern, 2100 UTC. Mary Jo Foley will be with him, his partner in crime. She'll be here in studio. We will be drinking beer. You can find her most of the time, though, when she's not at Rattle and Hum, at allaboutmicrosoft.com and on the Twitter, at Mary Foley. Thank you, guys. Great show. I cannot wait to see you out here. Thanks. It's gonna I be, know. It, it's going to be it, great. It, however many weeks that may be. <laughs> whenever, whenever that may <laughs> happen. It'll be nice. Shall be wonderful. Well, uh, waka waka flame do you all. Have a great day. We'll see you next time <laughs> on Windows Weekly. <laughs>